very quiet here. Shall we get started? Okay. I think today is a nice day outside, so we don't have a large attendance. But some people are following online, so I guess they like it better that way. Okay, so we'll, we're going to continue uh, processing in memory, which we started yesterday, and hopefully we'll finish it. Let's see. But it's an exciting area, as I said. And the question we asked was, can we actually design computing architectures with minimal data movement? And we also raised the question, does memory have to be dumb? I think if you want minimal data movement, uh, your memory needs to be intelligent. Uh, and we covered, uh, if you remember, uh, the top-down approach uh, to intelligent memory controllers, why we need them from the top down, from the demands of the applications and the systems. And we looked at the first direction we were going to cover in processing in memory, which is minimally changing uh, mem memory chips such that they can do very specialized computation very effectively. It's specialized, but also it's, uh, in a sense, you can do any co computation. Remember, we built uh, bulk bitwise uh, operations inside DRAM, and you can actually do any computation with those bulk bitwise operations, but you may not be able to map any computation very efficiently to, those bulk bitwise, to that bulk bitwise substrate. So I think this direction is still very, very interesting going forward, and there's a lot more work to be done in that area, especially uh, in terms of what else can be done inside the memory chip very efficiently by exploiting the internal structure. Uh, what else can be added in, inside the memory chip, uh, maybe minimally, so that you don't uh, get rid of the capacity benefits significantly uh, while getting significant acceleration, ben acceleration benefits. And what can you do at the application level and the system level such that you can map computations very effectively to substrates like this uh, in, in, uh, in memory. So there, it's, a, it's a very wide open area actually, uh, this first uh, part that we discussed, and there, there's a lot of effort going on. Uh, in all of those directions that I just mentioned. Of course, there's an approach over here which is maximally or uh, changing memory chips even, uh, something more than a minimal amount. That's also very interesting, but of course it's a bit harder uh, because that increased the cost significantly. Now you're thinking about a more, uh, perhaps a more general purpose substrate inside the memory chips that could be even more effective, but uh, it could have significant cost uh, limitations. Because usually whenever you add some significant amount of logic inside the memory chip, you're, you're going to increase the area cost. And that area cost will come at the expense of capacity. But that, that part uh, should also be explored, I think. But we're not going to talk about that, uh, that intermediate step over here. Uh, but we're going to jump to the 3D stack memory, which is something that already exists, actually. And something that could be put to use to perform processing inside one of the stack layers, which is uh, the logic layer. So let's jump into that. Uh, so basically, this is an opportunity. I think there's 3D stack logic plus memory that people have been building uh, for some time now. Uh, it was research for, uh, starting from the 2000, 2000s or so. Now these things exist. Uh, actually, high bandwidth memory that's employed in GPUs today that's fundamentally 3D stacked, although they use an interposer to connect the logic layer to the memory layers right now. But there's no reason why you cannot use uh, what's called tweet silicon vias uh, between the layers. So basically, the key idea over here is you have a logic layer, and you have a bunch of memory layers. And they're manufactured together, and they're connected via through silicon vias, as you can see over here. And through silicon vias are special vias that are very high bandwidth interconnect that can go across these layers. And people have figured out how to build these reliably at high bandwidth, at high frequency, uh, over the course of many, many years. In fact, there are many talks that describe this issue. Uh, from, uh, from uh, NVIDIA as well as uh, AMD, as well as uh, memory manufacturers. Uh, if, as you might imagine, these are very high bandwidth structures. As a result, their first use case has been GPUs, because GPUs need a very high bandwidth. Uh, and as a result, these 3D stacked memories have been employed in GPUs in a 3D, 2.5D stack fashion. 2.5D is really, you have the logic layer and the memory layers. They're not 3D stacked on top of each other, but they're like this, and there's an interposer connecting them. So not the through silicon vias, but going forward, I think these through silicon vias will provide even higher bandwidth uh, in those memories. OK, so that's the idea over here, which is nice. Now we have a lot of interconnect uh, between the memory layers and the uh, uh, logic layer. Uh, and actually, if you really want to go into the microarchitecture and the design of these, uh, we have a paper uh, that was published in ACM Transactions on Architecture and Code Optimization. The paper is called Simultaneous Multi-Layer Access. 
uh, increasing the memory of the uh, increasing the bandwidth of 3D stacked memory. So that actually goes into the detail of this design. Maybe I'll talk about it at some point, but not today, because that goes into the how you, how you actually design these things and how you actually increase the bandwidth uh, internally uh, as well as externally. Uh, so there, there's really interesting research that goes on into the design of this thing as well, which we're not going to talk about. But basically, this thing enables very high bandwidth, low latency connections between the logic layer and the memory layer, and you can put pretty much anything in the logic layer right now. It's, it's essentially a logic substrate. You can put processors in there. You could put reconfigurable logic in there. You could put simple GPUs in there. Uh, of course, one downside of this design is uh, you have uh, uh, logic and memory, and heat has nowhere to escape, right? Because if you're communicating internally between these, the heat keeps getting generated, and where does it escape? That's one key question. And it's usually a problem with 3D architectures like this. Whenever you have 3D stacking, uh, regardless of however you have it, this is very tightly interconnected 3D stacking, for example, using true silicon vias. But you could also have chip-to-chip -chip bonding uh, in some way without uh, uh, different chips being bonded together in some packaging. But whenever you do those things, you have heat generated, and heat basically gets trapped in between those layers, and you may have thermal issues. So you need to uh, find a solution for cooling. That's one of the downsides of the 3D architectures. And other, actually, even more true 3D technologies uh, are uh, under development. Uh, there was a talk last year, for example, uh, from Subhasti Shmitra from Stanford, who gave the distinguished lecture here at the CS department. He talked about a technology uh, called Next, uh, where they actually don't have these true silicon vias, but they actually have interlayer via connections that are much simpler uh, than these, and they use actually carbon, uh, carbon nanotubes to, to connect those layers. So of course, that's more forward-looking, and that's, that is more uh, uh, risky, if you will, in the long run. But if, if that becomes uh, available at some point, that's really true 3D technology in the sense that your connections between the layers are really, really small, and they can be very, uh, they, they can be many, many more compared to these true silicon vias. Because these true silicon vias need to cut across all of the layers, uh, they need to be wide, uh, they cannot be very small, uh, and they cannot be extremely high frequency as a result of that. And uh, so the bandwidth here is limited, because in a sense it's not true 3D. True 3D is when you have layer-to-layer uh, -layer connections that are very simple and small and short, and you can actually uh, have very high bandwidth across the layers. It's almost like uh, you, you, you have two layers, but it's as if you're communicating inside the same layer. Right? That's, that's the difference between true 3D and true silicon wheels over here. So there's a lot of potential, basically. There are a lot of interesting technologies under development. And if you're really interested in that technology, there are a lot of papers from uh, Subhasti Shmitra's group that talk about the next technology. It's, it's written n 3 x OK, uh, so basically, this presents an opportunity. These things exist. And this is an example from the Ramulator paper, which I discussed uh, earlier when we talked about simulation. Uh, basically, one of the goals of Ramulator was to be flexible enough to actually talk about, uh, to, to, to model uh, these technologies. And those technologies include a 3D stack technology, if you remember. So wide IO, wide IO2, these are early 3D stack technologies, not as mature. Um, MCDM, I think it's, it's Intel's 3D stack technology. They, they wanted to employ it in their Knights series processors because th those were actually meant to be very high performance computing systems with very high bandwidth requirements. And they actually did design memories they did employ uh, in those processors that are similar in nature to high bandwidth memory, but th that's their pro proprietary design. Uh, and there's high bandwidth memory, hybrid memory cube. So these are different in terms of their interfaces and uh, characteristics. High bandwidth memory, for example, is very similar to the DDR standard, except very high bandwidth. It, it modifies the DDR standard relatively small, uh, with relatively small steps. Whereas hybrid memory cube is a very large departure. Even though the fundamental technology is the same, uh, the way you communicate uh, with, with this logic layer is very different. Basically, you send packets to the logic layer. So the interface is actually much more abstract and much more amenable to doing computation. Basically, you send a packet, and the packet can be decoded. And you can actually encode anything in the packet. It's more of abstract interface as opposed to sending reads and writes. OK, so you can see that people are actually thinking about different interfaces to these 3D stack technologies, which could be very uh, amenable to doing computation inside that logic layer. And they exist. That's the, that's the point of the slide. So assuming these technologies actually exist, uh, and they do, uh, 
what can you actually do with them uh, in terms of doing computation near data or inside this logic layer? And when we first start looking into this, it's always good to, uh, when, when you uh, look into a research topic like this, it's always good to ask the question, what is the maximal benefit that you get if you actually do the maximal thing and change everything that you can imagine, perhaps, at that point in time? And the second question is, what is the minimal benefit that you can get if you don't change much in the system, but use this technology uh, in the best way as possible? So we asked both of those questions. I'm going to cover both of those questions uh, in this lecture. So the first question is the maximal part. How can we accelerate some important applications if we actually use 3D stack memory as, a, as an accelerator? Uh, and we can change many things. We can change the architecture. We can change the programming model. So sky is the limit over here. But we're going to assume 3D stack logic and memory. And what are the mechanisms for acceleration? So I'm going to give you an overview of several things uh, in this area um, with, with different levels of change, of course. Right? First, we're going to look at graph processing, and we're going to design a system that's meant to be for graph processing, but it's actually a more general purpose. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, the minimal approach, because minimal is very important, because maximal may not be affordable by many, many people in the world. It may be affordable by people who really care about a particular application, for example, machine learning. Uh, and then they're the ones who really lead the field, and they get uh, this technology adopted, and they enable the technology for others. But that may take a lot of time. So it's always good to look at what is the minimal support to provide in uh, a new technology like this, such that the adoption is easier. We're going to talk about challenges of adoption and processing in memory uh, at the end of the lecture, hopefully. So basically, what does minimal mean without changing the system significantly, uh, while keeping the existing programming model, while hopefully achieving significant benefits? OK, does that sound like a good plan? OK, so let's talk about the first one. So the first one uh, is actually really interesting. Uh, basically, when we started looking into this research, there was not much work in processing in memory, uh, in 3D stack memory. Uh, and we wanted to basically look at a case study where we could take an application and actually accelerate it as much as possible uh, using processing in memory mechanisms. And the, there are, of course, many, many applications. And graph processing was very interesting to us. It's, it's still a very fundamental application, basically. You can think of the world and m many data represented as graphs, and that's true in the world. These are some examples of very successful graph representations. Uh, actually, bi bioinformatics uh, is, a is another example where graph representations are co coming to dominate right now. You can represent the genomes as graphs and then operate on those graphs. Uh, and I think that's going to be even more important. Machine learning frameworks, actually, a lot of machine learning fra frameworks are based on graphs underneath. So you can accelerate the machine learning process through uh, by accelerating graph processing. So graph processing is very fundamental. And, and actually, this slide is old, as you can see, because uh, how many of you know how many users Facebook has right now? At least they claim to have. Any guesses? Who are use, who's using Facebook here? OK, I guess. <laughs> Say it again? Two billion. Two billion, that's right. Well, yeah, we recently wrote a paper uh, with Facebook. One of my students is there. Uh, it's actually going to be presented two weeks later. Uh, and the right number is 2.23 billion. <laughs> So as you can see, this is old. This was circa 2015. So when I gave this talk at Facebook, they corrected me saying 1.4 billion. And then I said, OK, this is 2015. <laughs> OK, I don't know if it's going down or up, but I don't care in the end. But that's a, that's a huge number, uh, as you can see. right? And this is probably much larger right now also, although I don't care in the end. <laughs> so basically, uh, the key problem is all of these uh, Really interesting things. Actually, Wikipedia is very useful, I think. Uh, I make use of it, although you need to be careful about what kind of knowledge you're getting in general in all of these, including Wikipedia. Uh, but they're based on graphs. Wikipedia actually pre presents its pages as graphs, uh, and they process graphs. The problem is, as the graph size grows, uh, the scalable graph processing becomes much more challenging. And you can throw cores at it, but we've done this experiment, actually, you can find in the paper. Uh, if you quadruple the number of cores, the benefit in terms of performance that you get is very low, basically 40%, which is not bad, perhaps. But you're putting 4x number of cores and 4x memory into this for getting this speed up. And that's not very efficient. So why? It actually turns out that many graph processing problems are uh, bottlenecked uh, in memory, especially when your graph becomes large. And we're going to get back to this when we talk about the minimal approach. We're going to look at graph processing again over there. Uh, and uh, if your input set is large, uh, you're bottlenecked by memory. So this is one example computation. This is actually the core of the PageRank computation that uh, has started Google's uh, 
uh, web search systems. That's at the heart of that. Of course, it's changed a lot over the years. But this is still the core. Basically, you look at your neighbors and you determine your rank based on the weights of your neighbors or ranks of your neighbors. And I'm not going to go through this, but you can imagine that uh, what's happening is whenever you're doing this computation, you have frequent random memory accesses because your neighbors are around you and not necessarily in the same address uh, vicinity. Uh, and you have also very little amount of computation. You can see that the computation is a multiplication and addition, right? Uh, so basically, if you remember the uh, two to three orders of magnitude difference in terms of energy that you have between computation and memory access, when you're doing this computation, you're exercising that many, 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 many times. Because we're essentially uh, bringing multiple pieces of data into the processor, doing this computation, which is really not costly, and writing the data back. And we're not using it, again, on the processor, even though the caches are there, because all of these are pretty much random memory accesses. Although there's some locality in some other parts of the graph processing system, which is really not this part. OK. So basically, this is a very good fit for uh, uh, processing in memory because of this reason, because of these characteristics. And this is the system that we designed. I'm going to go through a very high-level overview of the system, and the paper uh, is going to be one of the papers that we assign, actually. Uh, uh, then you can read more detail. Actually, this is a very uh, high-level system paper that has a lot of detail. So the basic idea is uh, you start with uh, this uh, processing, uh, you start with this 3D stacked memory plus logic chip and you incorporate processing inside the logic layer. So let's take a look at what's in the logic layer of one of these chips. Uh, so it turns out uh, this chip is internally divided into regular structures. Re regular meaning each of these uh, logic layer portions has a controller. And that controller controls uh, this, the memory on top of it. And this is this together, the controller and the memory on top of it, partitioned, is called a vault. And you have many vaults. Uh, inside the logic layer controlling the memory on top of them. So within a vault, essentially you have a memory controller and some network interface, and these vaults are connected to each other with some interconnect. We're going to talk about interconnect later on in the semester, but this is a crossbar interconnect, but it could be anything actually. Uh, crossbar helps communication uh, to be uh, nicely uh, distributed and not, not a lot of contention happens in this network. Um, okay. Uh, so basically, uh, inside this, normally you have a DRAM controller, but we're adding a simple in-order core. That's the idea. Uh, it's not a uh, hugely novel idea because people have actually proposed something like this before. But this in-order core is now going to be used for graph processing. And you can read the paper for detail. You cannot make this core extremely uh, power hungry because of the thermal constraint that we discussed earlier. As a result, this needs to be relatively limited in terms of what it can do. Uh, we could have potentially added accelerators. We didn't in this work, um, but that's another possibility which we're going to talk about uh, later on. Uh, and these in order, basically, essentially, you have a lot of in order cores right now uh, controlling the memory on top of them, and they're interconnected with each other. And let's take a look at uh, the, the larger scale. Now, if you want, basically, what, what happens is you actually partition your graph inside the memory across these vaults. And then they communicate with each other. Whenever actually you need to operate on a piece of data in the graph, you send a message to the in-order core that houses the data on top, of the, on top of it. So it's basically a message passing based system, which means that your graph needs to be mapped, uh, hopefully nicely, on this uh, memory structure. Now, if your graph is larger, you need a more scalable system, meaning that you need to actually interconnect many of these chips. So you have a hybrid memory cube or, or high bandwidth memory chip, let's say. And they're connected to many other chips, in this case, in this manner. I think uh, we use a dragonfly network, which we may talk about later on when we talk about interconnects. Uh, but you can read about it all as well. Uh, but it could be a two-dimensional mesh network also, in this case. Uh, but basically, uh, this is to scale the system. Of course, now you have uh, an unfortunate situation, which is you have the hybrid memory cube chip, and then you have interconnect. Right? Interconnect, of course, that interconnect is not good. Because that interconnect is not as good as, the, as, uh, as high bandwidth and as low latency as this interconnect over here. That's the same, almost the same interconnect as we have in current CPUs. So that's the scalability bottleneck of the system. But any system that you want to scale up needs to have some bottleneck, unless you can keep adding many, many layers on top of each other, uh, if you can scale 3D uh, with many, many layers. OK, so basically this is for the scalability of the system. You have many of these hybrid memory cube chips, and you partition your graph on top of these chips. And within each 
the hybrid memory cube chip, you also partition uh, the portions of the graph that are allocated to it. And this is programmed via message passing, meaning that you can communicate between these uh, vaults in order course via remote function calls. Uh, if, 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 of course, if the communication is inside a single vault, that's great because you don't go off chip. You just send a message to a core that's around here and uh, that core operates on the data uh, that's over here on its, uh, uh, on its vault, essentially on its uh, vertical stack. Uh, if you need to send a message to another core that's in another chip, you do that, but now you need to uh, go through the uh, bandwidth bottleneck to send the message. You may still benefit because you're basically saying that, uh, telling that core, do this operation on that data over there. You're not moving the data back and forth. Uh, so it depends, basically. Okay, uh, so that's the idea over here. That's the high-level system design. Uh, so this is programmed via message passing, uh, meaning you do remote function calls. Whenever you want to operate on data, you don't bring the data to the core that needs the data, but you actually send a message to the core that houses the data. So the data doesn't move. Uh, but, of course, you need to send the arguments to the data so that that function can be done. So some data moves, but the data that you're overriding doesn't, doesn't move. Uh, have you programmed with message passing before? Not many people? Okay, some people. Have you taken the parallel programming course? Is that, okay. So if you're programming with message passing, you know this. It's essentially very much similar to distributed systems programming. I'll give you an example of this. So this is basically uh, the current programming model that's not message passing based. Message passing basically says, okay, one of the, so W is, for example, in some other vault, you have a reference to it in this vault. You basically send a message uh, or, call, or a remote function call to the vault that houses W, and you basically send the function. Um, it's essentially a function pointer, and this vault actually fetches that function and expo uh, basically um, uh, uh, executes that function. And you, of course, need to send the argument. For example, if the argument, in this case, you need to, uh, you're doing this sort of computation, so you need to send v.rank to this vault such that it can actually do that operation inside. So it's very similar to distributed systems programming today, which is remote procedure core, remote function call based. Uh, you can think of this as a server, and you can think of this as a client. It's very similar to client server programming model as well. The server houses some data, and this client know which, knows which server houses which data, Essentially, you send a message, whenever you're operating on a piece of data, uh, you send uh, a message to the server that houses that piece of data to do something, it is a function call. To be able to send the function call, you need to indicate the function, you need to indicate the arguments. So you need to marshal uh, the function as well as the uh, arguments. And then the server executes the function and then perhaps acknowledges or doesn't acknowledge. Uh, so that's the idea over here. And if, if you want to know the details, you can take a look at uh, the paper. Uh, okay, so it's very simple. It's, if you know the existing distributed systems programming model, that's very similar. So I think that's one way I, of, of actually exploiting crossing in memory in today's system. You can send a message to any arbitrary memories. And if the memory is capable of doing that function, it can, t it can do the function or it can tell you, oh, I cannot do this function, so do it yourself. That's another possibility, of course. In this case, we assume that the memory is able to do the function because we designed the system ourselves. But if you want to make this more general, you can actually query the memory to do the function and the memory can uh, tell, okay, I cannot do the function, so do it yourself, for example. So it can be very general. Okay, uh, so this is one example of a non-blocking function, remote function call, which means that you actually send the function call. Uh, so you're, you're, let's assume that this processor is uh, trying to do this. Uh, and it needs to operate on data W. It sends a function call to this vault, uh, and it, uh, it doesn't wait for the function call to finish. Uh, this is, that's called non-blocking, which means that it can overlap to the computation that comes after it uh, with the function call that's happening in some other node. Right? That's the, the meaning of non-blocking over the, here. That's good because now you can actually continue what's happening and maybe you can generate more function calls or you can do whatever is in this re remaining part of the for loop that's not dependent on that function call. And if you do non-blocking function calls, at some point you want to synchronize uh, and this barrier is there because this function call, uh, this barrier says all of the function calls that I put out should be done by this time. That's good for programming, re reasoning for programming because you may actually need the data over here. Okay, you can read the paper for more detail over here, but basically, okay, this, I, I, I just said this, but I'll go over it again. You send the function address and the arguments to the remote core. 
uh, remote core stores the incoming message in its message queue over here. So we need to add this into the vault. Uh, and uh, basically it flushes the message queue when it's full or when a synchronization barrier is reached. That's the idea over here. You could also have uh, blocking function calls and that's described in the paper. So you may actually really need the function to be done uh, before you can proceed in the local core over here. And then you need to handle the blocking function call in some way. And those, are, those could be useful uh, under some circumstances where you really need that uh, data value. Okay, but that's described in the paper. If you're interested, you can read the paper. Okay, the other thing that's uh, new in this work is actually we've added some prefetching mechanisms. So it turns out these in-order cores are very simple and they have a lot of bandwidth available to them in the 3D stack uh, memory layers because of the true silicon vias and their high bandwidth. So they're not able to saturate that bandwidth. So they use a very small fraction of that bandwidth. Uh, and uh, another way of actually using that bandwidth to improve performance is to do good prefetching. And this paper developed some mechanisms to do prefetching. One is called message triggered prefetching. For example, whenever a message arrives, uh, if there is available bandwidth, uh, the uh, arguments, uh, the, the, uh, the addresses related to that message are fetched. So instructions could be fetched into the core, for example, prefetched into the core, and the data could be prefetched into the core. That's message triggered prefetching. There's also a linear prefetching, which is more streaming based prefetching, but that's, not, that's a little bit less interesting. So the key point is this in order core is so simple that it's not able to saturate its saturate the bandwidth. So you use some other mechanisms to saturate the bandwidth. One of the other ways of uh, improving the bandwidth could be adding multi-threading, for example, into the system or adding uh, out-of-order execution. But those are things that could actually increase the power consumption of the core significantly. And we have a limited thermal budget uh, over here. Limited thermal budget and limited area budget as well. Okay. So I've given you a very high level overview. There's a lot more discussed in the paper and I'd recommend that, uh, actually we should make this paper uh, one, of, one of the homework papers if we haven't done so already. I think the next homework will have it. Okay, uh, so uh, any questions? No? Cool, now you all want to do message passing based programming, right? Maybe. <laughs> Okay, uh, so basically what, what is the benefit that you get if you build this sort of system? This is, uh, we've compared to multiple systems over here and you may be familiar with this one. This is basically the baseline system which uses the DDR3 uh, memory and it's a lot of memory as you can see over here. Uh, it has 32 out of order cores. This is hybrid memory cube with the definition of the memory at that time uh, and we started this work in 2013 actually even though it was published in 2015. Uh, so at that time it was specified to have 640 gigabytes per second bandwidth connected to the processor. So one of the improvements is coming from the external bandwidth of hybrid memory cube. So this gives you higher bandwidth clearly uh, uh, and uh, you still have 32 out of order cores. And we also have a comparison system to this hybrid memory cube many core system where it's essentially the same but the cores are different. The cores are internally uh, in order cores uh, with, and we have 512 of them because you can fit more in order cores with this specification in the same area as you have 32 out of order cores over here. And if you look at the tester act system, it doesn't look like any of these because it's really doesn't have this processor memory dichotomy, right? Processor and memory are combined together in this logic layer. Uh, and the processors inside the logic layer in aggregate have access to eight terabytes per second uh, internal memory bandwidth across the layers if you do the calculations. So this is a lot more than what you can get in today's systems as you can see. And this is similar to, in terms of the cores, it's similar to this many core system. It has basically 512 uh, in order cores over here. Okay. So the, uh, yeah, we want to have this comparison point because we want to see the in order cores in the baseline system also. So the paper is a lot more analysis. I'm going to go through some uh, very high level uh, overall results. Uh, so this, these are the results in baseline systems. So if you, if, as you can see, if you just add a hybrid memory cube and keep the cores exactly the same, you get 56% performance improvement. Not bad, not, not, not that great. Uh, and if you actually make the cores uh, uh, in order compared to out of order, you lose some performance compared to these out of order cores with the same amount of bandwidth exposed to them. And this is the average across five different graph processing algorithms that are used with some si graph sizes that, with the largest graph size that we could get our hands on to. I think Wikipedia is one of them, for example, but not the entire Wikipedia, that's huge. Uh, okay, uh, so basically the existing systems don't provide a lot of performance improvement, even if you increase the bandwidth. 
If you look at Tesseract, without the prefetching mechanisms, you get about 9x performance improvement, which is significant because you're not moving the data uh, that much uh, uh, between the processor and memory. And also, you have access to bandwidth. I'll give you an example of how much bandwidth that we can exploit out of the 8 terabytes. If you add prefetching, though, you actually get a lot more performance. So it's important to exploit the bandwidth that you have that is not exploited by the in-order cores. And you get up to 13.8x uh, uh, performance improvement on average uh, across the five graph processing algorithms. So if you want to really see the details, you can read the paper. But where is the benefit coming from? Uh, that's a, always a good question, partly because Using processing in memory, we're able to exploit a significant amount of bandwidth. So these are the, this is the bandwidth that's exploited in the baseline systems. It's not a lot. Basically, out of 640 gigabytes per second, we're exploiting 200 or so, or 240. Whereas with Tesseract, we are exposing 8 terabytes per second to the cores, and uh, now we're able to exploit 2.9 terabytes per second. So there's a lot of bandwidth uh, mm -hmm. that can be exploited by the massive amount of uh, graph processing that's happening in the system. So that's one of the benefits. Well, this is the entire system. This is how, how much bandwidth it's exploiting. So the, uh, also there's a question of, uh, now we're changing a lot of things in the system, right? We're getting some bandwidth because, uh, or because we're actually uh, exposing this internal bandwidth, eight terabytes per second bandwidth to the cores. And we're also changing the programming model on top of that, right? So what is the relative benefit of these things? It's always good to uh, try to dissect uh, the benefits of uh, an entire system that you're designing. So that's what we try to do in this particular graph uh, that's based on some, uh, not all of the application, and this doesn't have prefetching also. So basically this is the hybrid memory cube uh, based system, traditional system, uh, with many core architecture, which is 512 cores. If you magically uh, give these cores more bandwidth, as opposed to 64, uh, 640 gigabytes per second, you give them 8 terabytes per second, magically, Without doing processing in memory, this is the performance improvement that you would get. It's about 2.3x, which is not bad, actually. It's pretty good. This is the benefit that you're getting purely because of the bandwidth uh, benefits of uh, this internal layers. But on top of that, if you actually do processing in memory with all of the changes that we make, pro programming model, etc., you get basically about 3x more, right? So basically, some of the benefit is coming from the bandwidth, and some of the benefit is actually coming from the programming model. And programming model includes the processing in memory mechanisms, uh, as you can see. You could do the study the other way around also. Uh, this, is, uh, this is hybrid memory cube, many core with conventional bandwidth. Uh, you could actually have Tesseract with conventional bandwidth. So this is basically Tesseract, as opposed to having 8 terabytes per second uh, in the processing in memory engine. Uh, you basically have, uh, limit the uh, memory bandwidth to 640 uh, gigabytes per second. So now you're looking at just the benefit of the programming model and processing in memory without increasing the bandwidth. And that buys you about 3x, which was the 3x over here, somewhat close by, which is what's expected. And if you actually, on top of that, uh, add the bandwidth benefit, it buys you about 2x more. So some of the benefit is clearly coming from the bandwidth, about 2x, and some of the benefit is really coming from processing in memory and the programming model, about 3x or so. And if you put them together, you get significant benefit 6.5x. And this is lower than the 9x we saw earlier because um, this is actually a subset of the applications where we did the analysis. So I like this graph because it really tries to, tries to dissect the benefits and uh, we could try to dissect even more but sometimes it gets complicated. Okay, so what about energy? Energy is of course uh, another big motivation for processing in memory. Uh, as I said, you could perhaps get performance in some other ways. I think it's very difficult, especially if you're bandwidth limited like this. It's very difficult to uh, get performance in some other way than processing in memory. Uh, but energy you could definitely not get uh, in, in the traditional system design. Uh, you, could you could not even imagine, in my opinion, uh, to get uh, this sort of energy reduction, a real uh, uh, system design which, uh, which, uh, which has a processor memory dichotomy where you're constantly moving data between the processor and memory. And this is basically the hybrid memory cube out of order engine's energy. Uh, so we, this doesn't even include the cores, out of order cores were expensive so we don't want to put it over here. And this is Tesseract with prefetching, this one example comparison point. Uh, you can see that the energy reduction is more than 8x uh, and a lot of the data movement, because of the reduction in a lot of the data movement. And there needs to be more analysis done in this I think. Okay, any questions? Yes. So how would uh, the last graph have been if we considered the uh, course energy from the left side? 
Oh, with the previous graph, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, we, uh, so if you look at the core's energy, these are the in-order cores. We consider the core's energy in Tesseract. But if you consider the core's energy, out-of-order cores, this would probably be very high over here. But if you consider in-order cores, I think it's going to be small. Yeah. But I think this energy analysis, you should always take it with a grain of salt. It's always very hard to do. Performance numbers are hard to get to begin with, but energy numbers are even harder. I'll give you better energy numbers later on, but it's not going to be on Tesseract. It's going to be on 3D stack memory again, but different workloads. Okay. Any other questions? Thoughts? Okay, let's talk about advantages and disadvantages of this then. So basically, this is uh, really the first processing in memory system that's designed for a large scale application. In this case, the application was special graph processing. Uh, and it's a relatively specialized processing accelerator for a graph processing accelerator using PIM. Actually, if you think about it, there's nothing really very specific to graph processing in this case. You could, these are in order cores, you could put anything on there, except we happen to just use it for graph processing. Maybe in hindsight, we should have used some other applications as well, but it, it takes a long time to do these studies. Actually, the, the, about more than two years of effort was actually spent in doing a lot of these studies and building the simulator and a lot of, a lot of things that's associated for, uh, with getting it right. So I, even though I say specialized graph processing accelerator, take that with a grain of salt, these in-order cores are actually relatively, well, there are general purpose cores, or you could do machine learning actually, or you could do whatever data analytics that you have. If you can try to map the databases on top of that, you could do, map the database on top of that. So it can, it's, it's very general purpose in that sense, except the evaluation was done with graph, graph processing. And you get significant system performance and energy benefits. Uh, it's not easy to get 13x performance improvements today. And these are application level performance. And maybe this is not, uh, actually I always think about, is this the limit? Is this the best we could do? Of course we optimize the system a little bit, but we didn't really optimize a lot. So maybe you could actually get even more. I don't know what's the limit. It's actually good to think about what could be the limit, but I'm not sure about that at this point. Maybe it's 30x, 50x, I don't know, uh, in terms of performance and energy that, that's even harder to guess. Uh, so it takes advantage of 3D stacking for an important workload, as you can see. Uh, and this is one of the first comprehensive studies actually in that. Of course it has disadvantages like every idea, as you know by now. Uh, and here the disadvantages change a lot in the system. Basically we're saying we're going to change everything almost. Uh, one thing I didn't say over here, let's go back over here. So how do you do this accelerator? So we assume that this is really an accelerator. Uh, I went back a lot. Okay. So basically you offload your graph computation on this accelerator and that happens somehow. So the interface from the host processor to memory, uh, well, in processing in memory engine was really like a GPU. You basically offload your program and that program executes until it ends. Basically, we didn't even partition the program between the processor and the, and the accelerator in this case, but you can think about uh, doing things that way, which means that this thing is on its own basically. Doing its, uh, you can think of this as like a discrete GPU where you offload your program and this thing runs forever almost, uh, as long as the program runs. It's non-cacheable, meaning that there's no data sharing between the processor and uh, this accelerator. And it's also physically addressed, which could be a limitation of the accelerator. Basically, everything over here is physically addressed and we don't have virtual memory. That could basically make the programming of this hard, right? Uh, so these are the downsides. So uh, if you go back to disadvantages, we change a lot in the system, even though the interface is like a GPU perhaps, uh, internally the programming model is very different. Okay. Basically, there, it's a new programming model in the sense that it's not used a lot, right? This sort of message passing with physical addressing is not used a lot in the systems, although remote function call-based programming is used a lot in the distributed systems. But we don't normally use it in a single node like this. And of course, uh, you have specialized, relatively specialized cores with specialized prefetching mechanisms uh, for graph processing. The other disadvantage is cost, of course. What is the cost of this? It's always hard to do that. Uh, but again, cost is a little bit of a red herring, if you will, because if you don't build something because of the initial cost, you may never get to the benefits of it. And if you, once you build something, it may, its cost may be amortized over what it's used for later. Right? Remember the Oculus example in New York? It cost four billion. Now everybody likes it, right? You paid the cost and you use it. So over time, the cost gets amortized. And if, whenever you design a first architecture, from scratch, it's always going to be costly. It's not going to be easy. 
Okay, and uh, this is the big technical disadvantage actually. The scalability is limited by the off-chip links that you have across these uh, hybrid memory cube or uh, 3D stack memory plus logic chips. Clearly, if your graph, uh, if there's a lot of communication between those chips, you're back to the uh, original bottleneck, uh, off-chip bottleneck. And you can improve that by partitioning your graph better, of course. If your graph is partitioned better such that the communications are restricted to uh, a single vault, well, first, certainly a single vault, but single chip, uh, and you minimize the communication across the chips, then you get a lot more benefit. Actually, paper has a study showing that if you have a better graph partitioning method using some automated uh, systems, you get more benefit uh, out of the system. But of course, it's a very hard problem. How do you partition an extremely large graph uh, across these different nodes such that you minimize the communication between the nodes? That's not an easy problem. Uh, and people are working on that problem. We'll see uh, how well it will be. And it also, of course, depends on the workload patterns as well, right? Okay, any other advantages or disadvantages that you can see? Okay, maybe you can think about it when you read the paper. And this is the paper, uh, and uh, you, you will read it and review it soon. Any questions? So I'll continue moving in this direction. This is going to be the most extreme we will do in a change in the system. We're going to change less uh, going forward. So we're still going to explore 3D stack memory, but we're going to look at what else can we do with 3D stack memory. And this is another example. This is a more recently published paper. Uh, we worked together with Google to understand their workloads for, for their consumer devices. Uh, these are Chromebooks, uh, Android phones, for example. And we wanted to understand the bottlenecks in these devices. And these devices are actually very, very, these devices are perhaps uh, even more energy constrained than anything else that we have in the world. Uh, and also have, that may not be true, like some of IoT devices may be more energy constrained, but these are very energy constrained. Uh, and the power uh, and the computation power is also much larger than many, many systems that we have uh, today that are embedded. Uh, which means that they actually are very much bottlenecked uh, by energy. And you know this already. So uh, we wanted to look at several workloads. Uh, of course, uh, we wanted to understand the, uh, the behavior of these workloads in the systems and understand how much data movement is a bottleneck. So one of them is the Chrome browser, which probably whoever has Android phones uses. Uh, and the other one is TensorFlow Mobile, machine learning framework that a lot of people use. And the other ones were video playback and video capture. And we're going to look at some of these. Uh, uh, the first, so I'm going to give you a high level overview first and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail uh, in the workload analysis. Uh, the first question is, what is the cost of data movement in these workloads? So data movement happens across the memory hierarchy. And the first key observation in this work is that actually a lot of data movement is spent uh, a lot of the system energy is spent on data movement in these workloads. On average, uh, more than 60%. That's a lot. So one of the potential solutions, so how do you actually minimize the data movement? You could do better caching, more conventional techniques, of course, right? You could improve what's happening inside the SOC such that you, don't, you minimize the data movement. Uh, but we wanted to explore a more, uh, a less conventional method, which is moving the computation close to data, assuming you have a 3D stack logic and memory chip uh, inside the DRM, on the DRM side. And the key challenge in this case is, you're, uh, in these devices, you're even more limited by area and energy budget and the thermal budget uh, uh, going forward. Actually, if you, if you think about other embedded devices, if you're, maybe you're not doing computation here, but if you have a, uh, some, I don't know, Microsoft has this HoloLens, for example, and, it's, uh, and a lot of people are trying to do the virtual reality. And there's a lot of machine learning, a lot of different applications that run over here. If you think about the limitation of that, you don't want to burn someone's head uh, because of thermal uh, reasons, right? So this, and, and you do want to actually not move data in those systems. So this uh, processing in memory is actually a very good fit for those kind of vision-based systems that do a lot of computation uh, to guide people and virtual reality uh, to, uh, to basically change people's perception or whatever you would like, you're trying to do over there. So you're very limited by the area and energy budget in those cases, even more so than this. So think about the forward-looking applications as well while we talk about these relatively backward-looking applications. Uh, okay, so we wanted to use processing in memory to reduce the data moment. So the second key observation, we wanted to analyze these workloads and figure out what can we move uh, to processing in memory. And our goal here is not to change the system significantly. Our goal is to keep the existing programming model as much as possible, but find these functions that seem very good fit for moving to processing in memory. So it's called function offloading. So we want to just offload some functions 
to uh, processing in memory engine. Uh, basically, you're running a sequential program, let's say, or a thread, and thread gets to a part of the program that says, oh, this is good for processing in memory, so offload it over there, that executes over there, and then when it's done, it returns the result back. So it's relatively simple uh, function offloading. And it turns out uh, a significant fraction of the data movement often comes from relatively simple functions here. We're going to look at some of these simple functions. Uh, copy is an, is an example over here, but there are more. Compression is another example, or data reorganization uh, is another example. Quantization, if you have a large matrix, for example, you want to quantize the values, that's another example. So those simple functions uh, are actually, uh, can be performed with very lightweight logic inside the memory or inside the logic layer. And we wanted to look at what, what you could do in the logic layer. So this is, you could actually put uh, something similar to what we did in Tesseract, a small embedded low power in order core. That's one example. Or you could have small fixed function accelerators for the given function uh, at hand. And this is, these are actually very interesting. Uh, it turns out this is much more efficient, of course, compared to this. Uh, uh, because you're, you're really uh, customizing the logic over here for the function that you're really trying to accelerate or make more efficient. And this is a, a good fit if your logic layer is reconfigurable. For example, if you have a reconfigurable logic layer, you can uh, put any kind of accelerator in there and you can potentially configure that accelerator during runtime. Right? Whereas if you put a core, you're less efficient. Uh, you, could do more you could be more general purpose, uh, but you cannot reconfigure it uh, to, to match the uh, function. So we looked at both of these solutions. I'm going to give you some results. And the paper has a lot more results, of course. So the key takeaway is if you offload uh, these simple functions to PIM logic, processing and memory logic, it could be either this one or this one. Actually, these results are with the accelerators. Basically, you reduce energy by 55%, like 2x uh, energy improvement. And you reduce execution time by 54%. Again, it's about 2x improvement. So it's not like the 13x that we've seen, but it's 2x. But we're not changing a lot in the system also. So that's why this is also very promising, because the programming model remains the same, except somebody needs to mark, mark those functions saying, OK, you should offload these functions to memory. OK, so let's take a look at a couple of these applications. Actually, all of these are interesting, and there's not enough space in the paper to talk about all of them in detail. And so the paper actually focuses uh, a lot on Chrome, talks about the other ones in some detail. Uh, video is very interesting also, because video already has specialized accelerators on chip. Uh, uh, to, to perform computation. And machine learning is going to have specialized accelerators. Uh, actually, in existing phones, there are not a lot of specialized accelerators, but going forward, there's going to be specialized accelerators on chip as well. I don't know about the browser, though. <laughs> okay, so uh, Chrome is very interesting because uh, basically everybody uses it, right? Well, not Chrome or some sort of browser, and browsers usually have similar, somewhat similar architecture. I'll go through this relatively quickly, but basically, you need to do loading and parsing of the web page, clearly, uh, to begin with. And then you need to somehow lay out the web page, render it. Uh, you calculate the visual elements and position of each object on the web page. And then you do some painting, rasterization, paint those objects and generate the bitmaps. And then you do com what's called compositing, assemble all the layers uh, into a final screen image. And you can read the paper for more detail in all of these. Uh, so we analyzed. Uh, uh, this browser. So basically, if you want to satisfy user experience, the browser should be fast uh, in loading the web pages. It should have smooth scrolling uh, and should have quick switching between browser tabs. And all of these are violated whenever, use my, whenever I use my phone, actually, <laughs> which is a bit sad, but <laughs> maybe processing in memory can solve the problem. Uh, so we looked at two important things. One is page scrolling uh, and the other is tab switching. And both of them include page loading, of course. Uh, so let's take a look at tab switching. You can look at page scrolling in the paper. I, I like this tab switching example because it uh, also uh, gives you an insight into how things are handled today. So what happens during tab switching? It turns out Chrome, process, uh, Chrome, uh, Chrome actually employs a multi-process architecture. Each tab is a separate process. And you need to switch between those separate processes if you're going from one tab uh, that has some web page to another tab that has some other web page. That basically is a context switch, and you'll need to load the new page. So there's a lot of memory consumption that happens uh, during tab switching. How fast a new tab loads and becomes interactive uh, is affected by the memory consumption. Uh, and it turns out Chrome actually uses compression to reduce each tab's memory footprint, because these devices are also memory limited. There is not a lot of memory in these devices uh, compared to other big server systems, for example. Uh, so for example, if your tab is inactive for some time, 
the CPU compresses it and press, uh, puts it in DRAM. This is called, there, there's an area in DRAM called ZRAM. Uh, it's essentially compressed RAM. Uh, and whenever you want to load a tab, go back to a tab, uh, that compressed tab gets decompressed and puts in, uh, get put, gets put into the CPU. And then you can operate on it. So we study the data moment. Uh, we actually emulate the user switching through 50 tabs. I don't know how many of you use 50 tabs, but I have a lot of tabs inside there. Uh, somehow they keep growing all the time. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, and there are two key observations over here. It turns out compression and decompression, because of that tab switching, contribute to about 18% of the total system energy. And a lot of data moves between the CPU and ZRAM, the compressed RAM. So the key question was for us, to, can we use PIM to mitigate the cost? So this is what happens if you use a CPU-only system. Let's take a look at that. You swap out N pages because you're running out of memory. And then uh, you basically have, well, this, this went really fast. Uh, you basically have uncompressed pages in memory. Uh, and you read M pages, so that's how you swap out actually. You, you read M pages over here, you compress them, and you write back to the zero. This is the compression part. The compression part will be very similar. And then you, need to, you can move to other tasks. So this is actually very data intensive because you're moving a lot of data uh, between the memory and the CPU in this case, and you may not really need to do it if you want to compress something. So compression, at this point, think about compression as a more general function also because it's not just used clearly in browsing. Compression is used in many, many uh, things, right? Whenever you want to say memory, you want to compress. So there's high data moment over here. So if you actually want to use processing in memory to alleviate that data moment, uh, the system looks more like this, basically. You swap out the end pages. You have, now you, you have uncompressed pages over here. You need to compress them, and you need to put them in ZRAM over here. And that's the idea. If you do this compression inside the PIM logic, there is no off-chip data movement. And also a CPU can be freed up to do other tasks. So you gain both uh, energy, because you're not moving data, and you gain also performance, because you can now move to the other task much faster. Right? Okay, and we actually studied uh, the mechanisms to uh, implement compression and decompression. Uh, of course, there are particular algorithms here. You can design accelerators for it, you can design General, you can use general purpose cores for that, certainly, as well. But you can read that uh, in the paper. So I think I've already said that. Uh, a large amount of data moment. And both functions, compression and decompression, I've shown you compression over there, but decompression is basically essential, the reverse of it. Both functions can benefit from PIM execution and can be implemented as PIM logic. And uh, I'm going to give you results later on. Any questions? So this is hopefully obvious, right? You're doing compression and decompression, which is really fundamental to many things. And you can offload it to memory. Now let's take a look at another application. Uh, this is TensorFlow Mobile. Basically here, uh, actually the, I wish I had more updated slides, but there have, you can find some uh, uh, slides in the backup that talks about TensorFlow more. I don't want to spend a lot of time on TensorFlow right now. But basically, uh, you have a neural network. Uh, you, you want to do inference, you give it some inputs, and that gives you some prediction. Right? Uh, maybe you're predicting whether this image is a cat or a dog, which may be boring at this point. Okay, so it turns out actually, according to our analysis of many different networks, and there are I think at least four different networks that we analyzed in the paper, uh, about 57% of the inference energy is spent on data movement in this case. And actually, 54% uh, of the data movement energy comes from functions that, are, that I call auxiliary, functions that actually prepare the data so that you can actually use it for some purpose in one layer or the other. And these are functions that pack and unpack the data or quantize the data. Uh, so packing, what is packing? Basically you have uh, a matrix uh, and uh, you pack it and you form a pack matrix. Uh, basically the idea is to reorder the elements of matrices to minimize cache misses during matrix multiplication because you're traversing the matrix in some order, for example. So you basically reorder. It's, it's a data reorganization operation. Uh, and it turns out this actually consumes a significant amount of energy and execution time uh, of inference and uh, the data moment accounts for a significant amount of energy. You can read the paper for more detail. There's a lot of numbers over here, but the takeaway is these functions actually consume a lot of energy because you move the data into the CPU, CPU needs to do the packing, and then reorganizes and then put it, puts the data back. And actually this packing is very simple arithmetic. Uh, you can actually offload it to very simple logic inside the logic layer. Quantization, that's another example. Basically, you convert 32-bit floating point uh, uh, data 
to 8-bit integers to improve the inference execution time and energy consumption. And a lot of neural networks operate efficiently by doing significant amount of quantization. People actually are finding out uh, different ways of doing quantization and they try to get rid of precision uh, in the uh, numbers that are stored uh, so that they can process more efficiently. And actually there are different types of network networks that people design. Some of them operate on binary data, meaning bitwise data, one or zero. That's basically ultimate quantization. You have, you represent an element with one or zero, right? But here in this case, we take the 32-bit uh, floating point and quantize it to 8-bit integers. But you could imagine actually variable size quantization as well, depending on the accuracy that you want to get. So there's a lot of research on quantization as well. Uh, TensorFlow uses some sort of quantization. In this case, when we looked at it, it was quantizing 32-bit floating point to 8-bit integers. And this quantization itself, again, what you're doing is you're, you want to chop off some values. Okay, that's, that's maybe a high level overview. You want to get, basically get rid of some precision in your values. Uh, and those values are stored in memory. You're bringing them to the processor, doing the quantization and writing the value, values back. That's a lot of data movement again. And you can see that significant amount of the total inference energy and inference execution time is spent on just doing this quantization. And majority of quantization energy comes from data movement because Quantization itself is not a very expensive, uh, um, expensive operation in terms of computation. And we know by now that operation energy is not significant compared to data moment energy. Right? So, uh, so basically it's a simple data conversion operation that requires shift, addition, and multiplication uh, operations. And none of these are exp as expensive as a DRAM access. So the key idea is to basically offload these operations to memory. You could again uh, do, do it in a general purpose logic or you could, uh, you could actually design a very simple accelerator to do the, this quantization operation. Okay. So basically, uh, the functions are good candidates for PIM execution and they're, it's, they're feasible to implement in PIM logic, whether it's a general purpose processor or an accelerator. So th this is a study that we did. We actually used a simulation to evaluate the ideas. Uh, and you can read the paper for more detail. Uh, but you can see that in this case, we used uh, relatively uh, less aggressive 3D stack memory compared to the Tesseract. Uh, you have still significant internal bandwidth and uh, off-chip channel bandwidth is smaller than the internal bandwidth, as you can see. Otherwise, there's no point maybe, uh, at, least, uh, at least from a uh, bandwidth perspective. Maybe from a latency perspective and energy perspective, there's a big point in uh, PIM. Okay, so these are the results. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. These are the energy results. This is compared to the baseline CPU. And this is if you have a core in the, process, in the 3D stack logic and memory. That's a general purpose in order core. And this is if you have a specialized accelerator in the way we designed it. Uh, let's pick the ones that we talked about. This is the compression and decompression, for example. Uh, of course, you can do texture tiling and color building, and those are in the paper. But compression, for example, if you actually offload it to processing in memory, you reduce the energy. This is normalized system energy. You reduce the energy by about 40% uh, for compression operation. And if you actually accelerate it um, in memory using a specialized accelerator, you, you actually reduce the energy total by 50%. So the accelerator is clearly more efficient than a general purpose core. Uh, and that's true for decompression as well. Uh, we talked about packing and quantization. That's also true over here. So you get similar results. Of course, it depends. Uh, the compression seems to benefit more. Okay. And you can read the numbers over there. So there's significant energy consumption benefits that you can achieve even with the simple function of floating uh, that we do. And if you're really interested in video playback and capture, the paper talks a lot about that also. Actually, that's, that's very interesting because people have optimized video playback and capture significantly because that's a huge energy consumer. Uh, and many people use uh, for their phones to vi uh, play videos today and there are specialized accelerators uh, on the phones for that. You could just put those accelerators in memory and you could customize them to, for a better operation in memory basically. Okay, I'm going to skip that. There's a lot of numbers over here. Uh, let me go into the performance. So performance also improves clearly. It's not just energy, uh, but energy improvements are much larger. For example, the compression performance, if you look over here, if you just use a core on the processing and memory side, you get about 20% performance. But compression performance is also limited by uh, how fast you can accelerate compression uh, using a specialized accelerator, actually. So here, the accelerator significantly improves the performance of compression because uh, a general purpose core is not very good at doing compression and decompression 
if you have a specialized accelerator for the compression algorithm or the decompression algorithm that you have, you get a very significant amount of performance as you can see over here. So this, this, is, this graph is very telling, I think, because it shows that, okay, you can gain performance by reducing the data movement, but you can also gain uh, significant performance uh, by customizing your hardware to the task at hand. And actually existing systems do a lot of customized accelerators for decompression and compression uh, on chip, not on the memory side, on the processor side today. Uh, okay, if you go to TensorFlow Mobile, okay, it's very similar, except uh, the, the benefit that you gain uh, over here is not as much uh, in terms of performance uh, when you customize, uh, or maybe we didn't customize it as good as we could possibly. Uh, that's always another question, right? Uh, when you customize the uh, computation logic to what you're trying to do, the benefit you get is not as, as large as the benefit you got, we got when we actually customized it for compression over here. But it's still a significant benefit, so the performance improves by about 2x. This execution time, if you reduce the execution time by 50%, your performance improves by 2x, right? Okay, maybe we should have said 2x over here because that would be a better sell of the paper. <laughs> okay. Okay, and that's all I'm going to talk about over here. This is another example of using 3D stack memory in a much, much less intrusive manner compared to the graph processing accelerator that we discussed. It's much less intrusive uh, because we're not changing the entire system. Uh, we basically are offloading functions uh, and still getting significant performance, but the performance and energy benefits are not uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, they're more like 2x in this case. Okay, and if you're interested, you can take a look at this paper. I don't know if we assigned this paper uh, or not. Okay, any questions? No. This may be a good place to stop and take a break, and then we'll uh, continue. So let's take a break until uh, half past, so 12 minutes. Okay, let's continue. So we're going to uh, give a bunch of more workload examples, but I want to make a meta point over here. There are two meta points. One is whenever you're actually examining some paradigm that's very different, it's always good to look at new workloads uh, and understand the impact of the paradigm uh, or on workloads. I said new workloads, but it's, it's always good to look at workloads, existing workloads, as well as if it's possible, new workloads, of course, going forward. Because it's really important to understand the impact of the paradigm on new workloads. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to change the world uh, because you have to show which workloads benefit, what kind of benefits you could potentially get with your best effort, of course. That's why we're doing these studies. And there's a lot more to do in this area. So if you look at these studies, they're good, but they're relatively ad hoc. Some, some, somebody, usually the first author, Amir Ali in this case, goes and essentially studies these workloads and tries to understand, oh, what is good to offload? What is not good to offload? What are the bottlenecks? So it's very much human effort oriented, right? So it'd be good to develop mechanisms that are more, uh, uh, more automated to enable people to actually, given a workload, which parts of the workload should you potentially think about offloading? And that's uh, some of the next steps that we're actually looking at right now. And it's, it's really important to the business ecosystem where you can take a workload and understand its bottlenecks such that you can decide, oh, this new technology can significantly benefit these parts of the workload, so we should really focus on this, these parts. And I think that's really important to develop. But the, what, that hasn't been done so far in the paper that I just described, no, nor in the Tesseract paper, nor in any of the other papers that I'm going to describe, although there is one paper that actually tries to do it automatically, but it's very limited. Uh, okay, that's one point. The other point here is, if you look at what we've discussed so far, the, uh, the parts of the applications that benefit a lot are actually, could actually be common to many applications. We talked about compression, decompression, that could be used in many, many different applications, right? You could actually have a compression or decompression accelerator in memory that could be invoked by uh, the system whenever needed. Uh, or data reorganization operations, packing, unpacking, uh, or quantization. Those could actually be used by many applications also. So maybe there are these kernels that could actually be uh, put inside the uh, memory as accelerators that could potentially be instantiated. And somebody, uh, and those could be packed into libraries 
And whenever you're designing hardware or software, you can use these libraries to actually instantiate the things that you want, and you can call these library functions that can do whatever you would like to do. So that's the kind of uh, place that we're trying to take this, because that also enables you to develop functions that could be useful for many, many workloads, and also that enables programmability of the system much better, right? But of course, none of this is possible without first understanding what those functions could be, that's, which is one of the things that this study provides, or uh, how, you would under, how, you'd, how you would go about uh, what parts of your workload could be offloadable uh, to whatever you have on the memory side. Okay, so I made my two meta points, but those are really important for research uh, going forward. Uh, we've also examined, I'm going to go through some other examples of the 3D stack memory and what you can use it for uh, in the system. This is another example. Uh, basically, uh, you can have a main GPU that's extremely powerful, and uh, this GPU is always bandwidth limited. That's why people are adding the highest bandwidth memory substrates to GPUs today, as we've discussed earlier. High bandwidth memory is already employed in uh, pretty much all GPUs, all high-end GPUs at least. Uh, and the cost of the memory will reduce because increasingly it'll be employed. Uh, initially, the cost is very high, but over time, the cost of the memory will be reduced because it's going to be mass produced and all of that, right? So you pay some initial cost whenever you adopt a new technology, even if it's high bandwidth memory, and over time, the cost reduces. That's why it's not good to limit yourself just by cost uh, going forward. Okay, uh, going back to the main point, you could have a main GPU, it's bandwidth limited, uh, and you could connect it to uh, a bunch of these 3D stacked memory uh, plus logic engines, and uh, because this is very much bandwidth limited, maybe it's, it, you, it does more computation-oriented tasks, of which there are many, of course, uh, and you may want to offload uh, the uh, memory, memory bottlenecked parts of your programs to the logic layer, such that they can execute with high bandwidth and low latency availability in the logic layer. That's the idea over here, basically. You can have uh, streaming multiprocessors or GPUs, small GPUs, let's call them, uh, in the logic layer because you cannot afford a very high, uh, uh, a, a very high-end GPU with very high computational power in the logic layer because of thermal limitations, as we said, and also area limitations. So maybe you have a small, wimpy GPU over here that is very effective at uh, memory-bound tasks and you have a very extremely powerful uh, heavyweight GPU over here that's very good at compute-bound tasks. And then the question is, how do you partition your workload and data such that you get good performance uh, out of the system? And that's very interesting, certainly, because this alleviates uh, the, the main GPU from memory-bound tasks, which is, not, which is not very good at because of the memory bottleneck. Okay, so we've done this uh, study. You can take a look at it. Uh, it's basically in this paper. And it's not just that in this paper, but actually we want it to be programmer transparent over here. Given a GPU program, uh, can you actually design a compiler that can tell you which parts of the program should potentially be offloaded to uh, these wimpy GPUs, simple GPUs, and which parts of the program should stay here. And I'm not going to go into the detail, but this basically does analysis on different code blocks and tries to figure out code blocks that are more memory bound, that basically operate, that basically need a lot of memory bandwidth. And those code blocks are selected as candidates by the compiler to be offloaded to uh, these simple GPUs. And then the decision of whether or not you really offload or not is made dynamically. So the compiler essentially has the task of marking these code blocks to say, okay, this may be a good place, uh, good, good, uh, good code block to offload. And it uses heuristics as well as profiling, meaning the number of loads and how much data you move with the loads and stores. Uh, and uh, after it marks the blocks, while doing execution, when you get to such a block, the system ne needs to make a decision. Should I offload or should I not offload? And that decision is based on, could be based on multiple things. It could be based on the occupancy over here. What else is offloaded over there, for example? So uh, it's, um, it's important to make those decisions dynamically because this logic layer may be busy for whatever reason, right? And you can read the paper for more detail. I think this is a good design, uh, except because it's a purely transparent approach. It doesn't change the program at all. It doesn't even mark the functions. There's no programmer involvement in here. It's all compiler-based, fully programmer transparent. So the benefits that you gain are relatively low. It's about, it's on the order of 30 to 50% performance improvement, which is not bad. 
And this may not be the maximum you can get, of course. Of course, you can come up with better compiler-based heuristics uh, to do this offloading better. And I think there is a very good resource direction in here. And this, is, this may be one of the only papers that looks at this problem. There are a couple more that built upon this paper later on. Uh, but there is a huge uh, opportunity over here to make the compiler algorithms better uh, while being programmer transparent, or make the compiler algorithms better while having a little bit more information from the programmer on top of that. So there's a, programmer, uh, there's a compiler part and compiler programmer interaction part that could be improved here potentially. And also there's a dynamic part that could potentially be improved. There's another thing over here that this paper looks into. Uh, so data mapping. And data mapping is a key problem as we've discussed earlier. So if you want to, for example, uh, uh, if you're bandwidth limited, and if you want to add A to B, write the result into C, it doesn't really help if A is here, B is here, and C is here, right? Basically, it's actually terrible. Uh, how do you map your data intelligently such that uh, the data that you're actually operating on is localized in the same memory stack? It doesn't solve the general problem, but it has some insights into uh, how you could map the data without changing the programs, in this case, based on some empirical observations as to how GPU programs that we have examined actually access memory. So it's a very limited solution from that perspective, but this is, the problem is very fundamental. How do you actually map your data to get the most out of processing in memory? Because if your data is mapped just the way I discussed, maybe there is no benefit in using processing in memory, right? Because you need to move the data regardless. Okay, so these are actually really fundamental problems. Uh, there are actually many, many questions here uh, I've covered. Uh, what do you offload is one question. How do you offload it is another question. Uh, who does the job? is another question, compiler or the programmer. Uh, and also, uh, how do you map the data to maximize the benefits is another question. So there are at least four fundamental questions related to processing in memory that is covered in this paper and I didn't go over it in detail. But those fundamental questions are not completely solved. This is one uh, good approach uh, to the problem, but there's a lot more to do in this area. Okay, so we've actually been looking at other things related to an architecture that looks very similar to this actually. How do you schedule the code uh, if you have different applications that are contending? I think this is very interesting also. I'm not going to go into this in detail. Uh, but this also tries to solve the scheduling and data mapping problem. Uh, but I'm going to talk about something like this, which is really not GPUs anymore. So uh, we're going to look at more workloads. And this is actually very interesting because pointer chasing is a fundamental problem in many applications. And it's very hard to improve the performance of uh, pointer chasing. So you know what, I what am I talking about when I say pointer chasing, right? link data structures basically. If you have a link, link list, for example, if you're doing a link list traversal or tree traversal, you're basically changing pointers. And it's uh, not easy to do that. So I'm gonna talk about how you can potentially accelerate with uh, processing in memory. And in the, uh, while, while, uh, during the course of this discussion, we're going to talk about some other problems related to processing in memory, like how do you handle virtual memory? Uh, although we're going to talk about the accelerator first. So basically, we wanted to look at this problem because this is a very fundamental problem. It's very difficult to solve. Uh, people have built prefetchers for it. Uh, actually, in my PhD thesis, I looked at how to actually parallelize these uh, dependent cache misses that are because of the pointer chasing operations. It's not easy. It's a very tough problem. Uh, and we wanted to look at accelerating this pointer chasing inside the memory, in the logic layer, basically. So there are two challenges to address, at least in this, this paper addresses. One is the parallelism and the other is the address translation challenge and we're going to talk about both. And the solution in the end, we're going to design an in-memory pointer chasing accelerator called Impica. Uh, it makes use of two key ideas. One is address access decoupling. It basically enables parallelism in the accelerator with low cost. Essentially, if you remember from digital circuits, we talked about an idea called digital, uh, not digital, decoupled access and execute. And that was a way of decoupling, you have an access engine and an execute engine, and these basically can uh, uh, feed each other and they run uh, mm, out of order of each other, and as a result they get higher parallelism compared to an in-order engine, but not as much parallelism as an out-of-order engine. So basically we're going to make use of that idea, decouple access execute architectures. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, a very hairy problem uh, with processing in memory, which is how do you handle virtual memory? Because virtual memory is a concept that's actually very useful for the programmers. Uh, and if you remember again from digital circuits, we covered a lecture on that. Uh, essentially, uh, if, if you have virtual to physical address translation, how do you do that inside the physical memory? And the solution we will come up with is not going to be fully satisfying, I think. It could be more employed in the embedded systems, I think. 
but it's not clear if you can employ this in very large scale systems very easily, in my opinion. Uh, so it's good to think about it, uh, think about this problem. But it's a very hairy problem. It's, people, I think, need to think about how do you do virtual memory or ad address mapping in general whenever you have systems that can do processing in memory. Okay, so these are some open problems, actually. This is definitely a more open problem as well uh, as, the, as, the, as the ones I've described just now. So the key results will be we're actually going to see speed ups. So pointer chasing operations will speed up significantly. These are hard to speed up. Uh, um, hard to speed up uh, fundamental operations. And we'll see that it, uh, we're going to improve it, the throughput of a database by about 16% because databases actually use these linked data structures like B-trees uh, quite often. Although we did talk about bitmap indices yesterday, right, as an alternative to B-trees. So there are databases that use B-trees, there are databases that use uh, bitmap indices. So actually processing in memory could be good for both of them depending on what you do inside the memory. Okay, and we're going to see significant energy reduction also. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the problem first. So linked data structures are very common in many important applications, and these are some of them. Well, some of them are not applications, but databases heavily use linked data structures, key value stores, actually use hash tables, databases use B trees, uh, and they're connected by pointers, right? So, and uh, traversing these linked data structures requires chasing pointers. So if you want to find A in this tree, for example, or dictionary, a dictionary actually can, be cons can consist of trees. What you do is you basically send the address of the first node, get the data, compare whether that matches the thing that you're looking for. If not, uh, basically whether the, whether the uh, node has the key that you're looking for. And then if not, go to the next one, do the same thing. And then if not, go to the next one, do the same thing. So you bring a lot of nodes uh, you send a lot of addresses and bring a lot of data back into the CPU. And if your tree is huge, then you have a huge problem, basically. You keep going back between the CPU and the memory. And this is very much latency bound. If your memory latency is high, which is high, uh, essentially the address of the next node, to be able to get to the next node, you need to fetch the previous node. As a result, you're always paying the cost of uh, the round trip memory latency to be able to figure out what to do next. And people actually, as I said, have designed prefetchers for this. They don't necessarily work really well because the access patterns are not regular, right? Uh, so it's, it's a tough problem. So you have a serialized and irregular access pattern and it turns out the paper has some analysis. It looks at the database and graph processing workloads and basically shows that uh, whenever you're doing pointer chasing, the cycles per instruction of the part of the code that does pointer chasing is 6x higher than other parts of the code. So you're certainly, uh, the CPU is very inefficient. It has 6x higher cycles per instruction for pointer chasing. So our goal is to accelerate, of course, this inside the main memory. Basically, we would like to be able to do this. You have 3D stack memory over here, and we'd like to be able to uh, tell 3D stack memory, find A for us, and it does a search by itself and returns the data after it does a search or returns something if it, doesn't, if it is not able to find the data. So what are the challenges here? There are multiple challenges. Certainly you can design an accelerator to do this. Uh, no question about that, right? Basically it's a pointer chasing accelerator. You have some inputs and you have some outputs and the paper discusses them. But you need to be careful with the design of the accelerator. That's why I'm going to point out over here. So if you have a CPU core, this is what uh, pointer chasing somewhat looks like. You, have, you do some computation, you do some memory access, you do some other computation, and then you do a long memory access over here. In memory accelerator, it basically speeds up the memory access, and that's the benefit of the in-memory accelerator in here. Of course, there's energy benefit also, which we're not going to show here. So it's faster for one operation over here, which is good because we've reduced the memory latency. We're not going through this round trip, and logic layer has much lower latency access to memory. But if you have another CPU core, if, if you have some sort of parallelism in the CPU core, like multi-threading, uh, the CPU core sends another computation, and it can overlap these memory accesses. That's the beauty of multi-threading. Uh, but if, you're, if your accelerator is not able to support parallelism, then you have a problem. You're serializing these memory accesses uh, behind each other. So basically, we don't want to have an accelerator like this. Um, this is the downside of a shared accelerator. So you need to design your accelerator to be capable of handling many, many accesses. And that's one uh, realization over here. A simple in-memory accelerator can, be, can still be slower than multiple CPU cores. And the opportunity is that a pointer chasing accelerator still spends a long time waiting for memory. So many CPU cores, or you can think of these as hardware contexts that are sharing an accelerator, and they all want requests to be serviced. And if your accelerator is not able to 
support the bandwidth of all of them, uh, then you have a problem. So we're going to exploit this opportunity. We're still spending a lot of wait time waiting for memory. And memory access is still significantly higher than the computation when you're doing linked data structure traversal. So the idea is very simple. It's address access decoupling. Uh, basically, we have an address engine in the accelerator and an access engine. Think decoupled access and execute again. This is the uh, access engine. This is the execute engine. Address engine basically does the address calculation sent by the CPU core. This is the first one and then sends uh, a message to the access engine saying, do the memory access for me. And then the C this CPU core sends its uh, computation and the address engine does the computation and sends uh, the to the access engine, do the memory access for me. And now actually the address engine and access engine, engine are decoupled. You could actually take care of two streams or two different pointer chasing operations from two different cores. And you could keep doing that basically. Now, the beauty of this is now uh, you, you're actually faster than uh, two cores because you overlap the shorter memory accesses uh, with the computation that's going on in the address engine. And that's the key idea of decoupled access and execute. All, as, again, uh, if, you have if you're decoupling uh, execution or address generation uh, with access, it's not just address generation because it's also execution. You need to do the comparison of the keys, for example, if you're searching for a key over here. Uh, so basically, it's the decoupling of the execution uh, and access over here. You're overlapping both of them. And your accelerator needs to be able to handle that. Okay, so it's obvious, hopefully. Once you know the concept of decoupled access and execute, this should be obvious. Okay, so this is what the uh, microarchitecture of the Impica core looks like. You have this address engine that we've discussed, and you have an access engine that has access to the memory controller. Uh, address engine basically sends, uh, using a FIFO queue, sends addresses uh, to the access engine. And access engine sends the responses, basically the data, back. And then they communicate through these queues, so it's relatively simple. And it turns out you need to have a cache, so locality is very strong. Uh, even, if, even if you have uh, in-memory computation, having an SRAM cache over here actually helps a lot because this is much, much faster still. So in, in all of our works, actually, I, uh, Whenever we talked about Tesseract, for example, uh, or, uh, or the Google workload study, all of the cores over there had their own caches internally. So that, that's, uh, the locality principle is still very strong. You don't want to be paying the long access penalties to DRAM if you can cache some data over here and access that cache data relatively fast, even if you're uh, near memory, basically. Okay, so, uh, and then this address engine communicates with the CPU to get pointer chasing requests. So let's take a look at one example over here. So let's assume that you get two traversals from two different cores. It's, like, it's going to be obvious over here, basically. Address engine is going to do the first traversal, send it to the access engine, and the second traversal will be pipeline behind that, basically. Oh, okay. So it's nothing. And then they could go out of order, actually, potentially. right? But then your queues need to be uh, a little bit better designed. Okay, so that's simple, right? Any questions on that? Okay, I think if you're, if you're really interested in this, read the paper and also read the decoupled access execute paper from ISCA 1982 that actually introduces the idea for general purpose processors uh, by Jim Smith. Okay, so let's talk about the second challenge, which is, uh, I believe, a lot harder. Uh, and we're going to have a solution, but it's not going to be extremely satisfying. It's going to be simple. Uh, it could be done in simple systems, embedded systems that do not have a whole lot of memory, I think. If, but if you have a lot of memory, then I'm not sure how you would do it. So basically, the problem is uh, you use virtual addresses to do, uh, to do uh, to pointer chasing right, in the CPU. And you have a translation engine in the CPU that takes the virtual address, translates it, and you get a physical address. And that translation is pretty complicated. You basically have a TLB, of course, but if you're missing the TLB, you need to do this page table walk. It's an example from x86. It's a four level page table walk and you can read the details. You can watch my lecture if you haven't taken digital circuits. Uh, that's okay, but basically you need to translate this address to a physical address and that takes some time. It actually costs uh, energy and performance uh, and occupies area uh, and occupies memory as well. So basically, uh, if you want to do this translation, this is what you do. This sounds terrible, right? Basically, you do a lot of memory accesses. And then you get the pointer, uh, physical address for the pointer. But the problem is, if you want to offload this computation to the logic layer, okay, maybe you can do the pointer chasing, 
but you need to do the translation. But there's no TLB, translation lookup side buffer, or this memory management unit that does this page, walk, uh, page table walk on the memory side. What do you do? You could actually go back to the processor's TLB to do their translation, but that's kind of stupid, right? You don't want to do that because now you actually, for every memory access, you're going back to the CPU to do the translation. So you don't want that. You could say, okay, I'm going to duplicate the TLB and MMU over there. Unfortunately, this is costly and creates compatibility issues. So for example, if you're designing CPUs with some ISA uh, and that ISA has a particular uh, virtual memory uh, definition, uh, you're, you need to essentially have your memory uh, correspond to that virtual memory definition. And your, if your memory is actually uh, uh, supposed to support many, many different CPUs uh, that are different ISAs with different uh, page tables, then what do you do on the memory side, right? Do you actually instantiate all of those page tables on the memory side? So it's a very hairy problem from that perspective. This makes you want to get rid of virtual memory in general, right? Because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of overhead into virtual memory. But this is an area that needs to be rethought completely in computer architecture today anyway. But pressing in memory makes it even worse. So duplicating is not, not only costly, but what do you duplicate? Which ISA do you support uh, over here? Maybe you want to be agnostic. Maybe you want to be reconfigurable, but you need to reconfigure then uh, somehow. Okay, so the problem is the page table walk requires multiple memory accesses. And the solution in this work is to completely decouple the page table of the accelerator from the page table of the CPUs, such that this page table is just doing uh, pointer chasing. So if you look at the CPU page table, it maps a virtual address space to a physical address space, right, which is good. You basically have these mappings of virtual pages to physical pages, and they could be anywhere in the virtual address space. What we're going to do is limit the MPICA page table to a very small fraction of that virtual address space that the CPU has. Basically, we're going to create an MPICA region, and all of the pointers, all of the pointer chasing is supposed to be done over here. So if there are some pointers that you're going to chase, you'd better map them in the MPICA region. It's a reasonable solution. Uh, it's basically a partial to any mapping. This, what, what does this do? Basically, now you're actually dealing with a much smaller virtual address space to map on the accelerator. Now, this is good if you have a very simple accelerator that's embedded, but if you, if you need to pointer chase across a huge amount of memory, then you still have the problem that this region will be large. That's why I said this solution is not completely uh, satisfactory, but I'm not sure if there is a better solution that exists at this point uh, in processing in memory. So if you do that, basically, you're, now you actually need to map a very small region. That's why your page table walk becomes much simpler. It doesn't need to have these very large structures because this region is very small. And then your calculations, again, become simpler, and there's design of this page table, um, uh, as you can read in the paper. So basically, you can simplify the design because you're dealing with a small region. Okay. And you can, you can read the details in the paper. And if you're actually interested in this area, this is a very wide open area to make contributions in. And let's take a look at the results. So if you do all of this, if you design the accelerator, do this virtual memory uh, uh, traversal on the uh, Impica side, what, what are the benefits you get? So there are micro benchmarks. You could actually download a lot of this online and do the studies yourself as well, uh, which is always good to do in research. Upload your code online so that people can reproduce your results. Uh, so this is the speed up that we get compared to doing uh, the traversal on the CPU uh, with a, uh, for a linked list, hash table, and B3, of course, with some access patterns, uh, with some input sets. So linked list is actually the most limited because you don't have a lot of parallelism. So uh, the comparison point is uh, the baseline CPU with uh, extra 128 kilobytes L2 added because that's kind of the cost of the accelerator on the memory side. We just want to equalize it. Although an extra 128 kilobyte L2 doesn't buy you much as you can see. It's, it speeds up very little compared to the baseline. But uh, if you do the linked list travels on the Impica side, you actually gain 90% performance. And linked list is one of the most limited uh, examples, right? If you do the hash table, because you're not just limited by pointer chasing, you're limited by other things in the hash table. Also, your performance benefit is 30%. If you do the B tree, it's about 20%, which is still significant because these are actually very hard to accelerate programs. And we important this uh, uh, to a database, I think DBX1000 uh, in this case. So this is the throughput of the database. If you actually uh, do uh, 
acceleration of pointer chasing on the memory side. Well, this is the baseline. If you add 128 kilobyte L2, it turns out the database actually benefits from it in some other parts of the code. So you get 2%. Uh, if you actually add one megabyte L2 database, it benefits from that also. In other parts of the code, again, it's a 5%. But in PICO overall, it improves throughput by about 16%, which is actually significant uh, in, a, in a database application. And this is the latency. So this is the request latency, basically. You can see that there's a commensurate improvement in the request latency also. OK, you can read the paper for more results. So what about energy? Uh, you would expect energy improvements also, and that's what you get, actually. These are the micro benchmarks again. This is energy normalized to the baseline, uh, plus uh, this energy of the extra 100 kilobyte L2. You get some benefits, sometimes, not always. So the energy improvements are actually pretty good over here. And even in the database, the energy improvement is pretty significant. OK, this paper also does analysis of what is the area and power overhead that you need for this accelerator. You can read the paper for more detail. But it's basically, it's not a lot. Uh, it's, it's similar to the size of, I think, uh, uh, maybe 128 kilobyte L2 cache or something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, so the power overhead is actually, whenever you add something to a memory, you increase the power, right? Because you're basically doing something more. So you need to support that power. We discussed this yesterday. There's no free lunch. Uh, so whenever you're doing computation inside the memory, Yes, you need to add more power, and you need to add more cooling. And if you're doing massively parallel computation inside there, then now that looks like a CPU. And we use a lot of infrastructure to cool our CPUs today, right? and GPUs as well. So uh, memory will not stay as it looks today, which is basically not cooled. But it's going to be cooled going into the future if you have processing in memory. OK, so that's the paper. Uh, well, that's, that's not the paper. I've already given you the paper. Uh, any questions? So I'm, giving you, I'm actually giving you a lot of research uh, areas also. There, there are a lot of questions to be answered going forward. So we've been looking at certain linked data structures are actually one of the toughest things. Uh, and I've done a lot of work on linked data structures, so I, I like them. It's good to work on really tough problems. Uh, and if you find solutions that can accelerate tough problems, they're actually very fundamental and useful. So I've been looking at actually how to do that uh, transparently, completely transparently as well. And this paper actually develops a mechanism where they, you have an out of order core and you have a memory controller and you basically figure out which parts of the program are actually uh, doing dependent cache misses, which is essentially linked data structure traversals. But you do that uh, without any information from the program. Basically, you're, you look at what, what the instructions are executing and you offload those instructions to the memory controller. And this paper also shows significant benefits uh, from doing that. Uh, but it's a bit more hairy, of course, to do that if, you're, if you want to strip out uh, some code transparently while it's executing using purely hardware. OK. Any questions? So let me, uh, now I've given you a lot of examples of this part, basically. How do you use 3D stack memory as an accelerator with varying levels of changes to the architecture and the programming model and different mechanisms for acceleration? And we really touched upon many, many issues uh, including who does, who does what, how do you do it, uh, and many, many other questions like virtual memory. We didn't touch cache, co uh, cache coherence that much, but we talked about that yesterday, and we may talk about it later on. Let's now switch gears a little bit and talk about this minimal processing in memory support. Uh, actually, I will touch cache coherence a little bit uh, when I talk about this, because whenever you're... Uh, so, for, for example, the graph processing accelerator that we discussed doesn't have the problem of cache coherence, because we said it's all message passing based, right? You don't need to keep caches coherent in that case because, uh, yeah, that gets rid of the problem. But that's very different from the current models. Uh, if you're doing offloading in fu of functions, you need to maintain cache coherence, as we discussed yesterday with the row clone. Uh, basically, you need to flush the caches before you actually do the function, for example, right? Uh, and ensure that nobody touches uh, that function. So that's cache coherence, and that has some overhead in the results that we've discussed. What if we don't want to change that mechanism that much? So how do you do that? Uh, so basically, this is the next question. What is the minimal, minimal processing in memory support we can provide without changing the system significantly while achieving significant benefits? And we're going to look at the idea of uh, PIM-enabled instructions. That's the idea we came up with uh, when we first asked that question. And the idea is very simple in this case. We're going to add a lot of restrictions to what we can do in memory. 
Uh, so the goal, as I said, is to develop mechanisms to get most out of the near data processing systems with minimal cost, minimal changes to the system, with no changes to the programming model. And the key idea, there are two of them. One is to expose each PIM operation, processing in memory operation, as a cache coherent, virtually addressed host processor instruction. This is called a PIM enabled instruction. And we're going to restrict it to operate only on a single cache block. Now this will aid the cache coherence mechanisms because whenever you go beyond cache multiple cache blocks, you're touching multiple things and you need to keep, that, keep everything coherent in the caches. If you're doing a single cache block, you can lock that cache block and you can operate on it in memory and nobody else touches it. So you have minimal changes to the cache coherence. So this is one example. Basically, this programmer can add these or a compiler can turn some things into these PIM add instructions, similar to what we've discussed earlier. And that gets translated into this PIM add instructions natively in the ISA. And there's no change to the sequential execution programming model because this is just an instruction that comes in the sequential stream. No changes to virtual memory because the translation is done on the processor side. And then it, uh, the, uh, the instruction gets shipped to the memory or not. You have minimal changes to cache coherence. And there's no need for data mapping, the problem we discussed, because each PIM enabled instruction is restricted to a single memory module because it operates at most on a single cache block. We're going to look at this more. And then the second key idea over here is then the key question is who executes this instruction? Should you do it in the CPU or should you do it in the memory? And as I said, there is no best way to always execute an instruction or always execute something. Uh, and this is determined based on simple prediction. So if, if, the, uh, if the data value is in the cache, for example, do it in the processor, otherwise in the memory. That's one example predictor, right? And we try to execute each operation at the location that provides the best performance, basically. So let's take a look at this. This is the same program that we discussed, the page rank uh, example. Uh, so if you do this uh, computation today in the conventional architecture, you need to bring a single cache block uh, into the host processor, and then you need to write back the data as a cache block. So you have 64 bytes in and 64 bytes out in an existing system to be able to do this operation. Whereas if you turn this into a PIM enabled instruction, Let's assume this is a PIM add. All you really need, uh, and that gets translated to this. All you need is to send the value to the main memory, and then the main memory does the addition. So hopefully you send only eight bytes because that value is not that large, right? That's the idea over here. Okay, so basically if you look at the numbers over here, uh, we reduced 128 byte communication to eight byte communication. Okay, so the key question is, uh, let's assume that you actually use this sort of instructions in different applications, and graph processing applications are an example, but I'm going to give you more examples uh, soon. Uh, and you rewrite your program such that it's written this way, and you execute all of these PIM-enabled instructions inside the main memory. Is that good? It turns out it's not good, so these are some workloads that benefit. You get significant speed-ups. That's good just by adding these instructions at the right places into your program. But some workloads actually lose performance. So the ones that benefit, uh, benefit because there's reduced memory bandwidth consumption due to in-memory computation over here, and they have relatively large data sets. You can see that there are more vertices over here that don't necessarily fit in caches. But there are these workloads that where caching is very, very effective. As a result, if you push uh, these uh, PIM-enabled instructions to operate always inside memory, you lose performance because you actually increase the memory bandwidth consumption because when you cache the data, you brought it into the cache once and you're not consuming any memory bandwidth if you keep updating the data that's in the cache. Right? So you need to be intelligent about this. There, uh, if your caching is very effective, you don't want to ship the uh, code to memory. That should be obvious, hopefully. So we're going to have a mechanism to predict it. And that's not that hard to predict. You can read the paper for more detail. OK, so uh, this is an example instruction over here. Uh, basically we have a fence because again uh, we want to make sure all of the previous instructions complete before you execute uh, this fence. That's another. So let's take a look at what are the instructions over here. These are some examples based on our analysis of the program but there's no end to this analysis if you think about it. Uh, you need to find the best instruction. And a good substrate on the memory part is specialized uh, units or reconfigurable units that are configured to execute these operations at very, with very high efficiency. Because we're shipping just one instruction, right? That you don't need to have a full core on the memory side right now. You just need to have a simple execution unit that satisfies the specification of this instruction. So uh, these are some graph processing workloads. This, for example, it has eight byte integer increment. Uh, 
uh, or 8 byte integer min, uh, breadth first search, for example, you can do floating point addition, hash table probing, histogram in the index, uh, the stream cluster, it does a lot of uh, streaming data and clusters into uh, uh, clusters of streaming data as it comes in. So it computes the Euclidean distance. So that's one of the more complicated operations, as you can see. And its input is 64 bytes, and the output is 4 bytes. And dot product operation, uh, that's good for support vector machines, but it could be good for many, many things, clearly. Uh, but we examined support vector machines and found that dot product is useful to implement. So one of the key issues over here is how do you define these instructions? Clearly, these are application specific, as you can see. Maybe not as specific to a single application, but it could be used by a class of applications. Uh, is it supposed, is it, would it be an ISA on the memory side or should these be just uh, configured uh, potentially in the reconfigurable architecture that you have in the logic layer? So there are a lot of questions over here also, which are interesting, but I think those are all doable. And also if, you are, if your memory doesn't implement a particular instruction that you have, uh, maybe you just don't ship it to memory, right? You have that potential over here. Okay. Uh, I've already said this, you execute these either in the memory or in the processor, a cache coherent, virtually addressed, uh, and atomic between different PIM enabled instructions, but not atomic with normal instructions. So you, you use PFANS for ordering to make sure that all of the instructions that are executed in the processor, uh, executed in memory, are done before you proceed with any instruction that comes after the fence. So it's very much similar to a fence. Okay, so let's talk about the single cache block restriction because this is really the fundamental thing that enables this to be simple uh, and also not change the uh, architecture a lot. Uh, so basically each permeable instruction can access at most one last level cache block. Similar restrictions actually exist in existing atomic instructions and one application of this is doing atomic updates on the memory side. If many processors are doing updates to a particular cache block, uh, why don't they do those updates on the memory side, right? Okay, so the benefits is that uh, if you have a single cache block that gets mapped to only a single memory module and the data, data mapping problem goes away, uh, you get easier support for cache coherence and virtual memory and you get simplified locality monitoring. Basically, you can check whether this cache block is in the cache or not uh, with some predictor, of course, right? You could access the tax store early on, for example. Uh, you can see the paper for more implementation potential. So there are a lot of benefits. Of course, the big downside is you have a single cache block that you're operating on, right? Now you cannot do a bulk operation like we've discussed in AMBIT. Your benefit goes uh, down significantly. And also it's just a single instruction. You just operate on the single cache block. And if you want to operate uh, on, the, on it again, you need to send another instruction. Right? So you're not doing function, off, function offloading to memory as well meaning that you're going to lose a lot of benefit from this. The upside that you would gain will be this, of course. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so how does this work? This is in microarchitecture. Uh, basically, uh, you have this uh, PIM enabled instruction computation units in the processor. That could be part of the out of order core, actually. It doesn't need to be outside, but this is a good way of showing it. Uh, and you, can, you, you also have the computation units in memory. Uh, you can execute the instruction either here or here. And this is the thing that decides where to execute the instruction. Whenever you get an instruction, you check the locality monitor. If the locality monitor says execute in the host processor, you execute it over here. And hopefully the locality monitor is correct and the cache block that you're operating on is in the cache or in one of the caches over here. And if your locality monitor says execute over here, then you execute, uh, then, then the processor basically sends a message to a 3D stack memory and the 3D stack memory executes the instruction and returns the result, if there is a result. Uh, actually, there's no result in this case in many of the instructions, right? Uh, because the result is written into memory. Uh, and while you're doing that, the PIM directory uh, ensures cache coherence. Basically, when you're operating on an instruction uh, over here, you need to ensure that nobody else gets it you need to ensure cache coherence, and that's where the PIM directory comes in. And you can take a look at the paper for more detail over here. No questions? Am I going too fast? Hopefully these are relatively simple concepts, right? But it's just the realization that makes a big difference. Mm. And this is actually something that's already being put into the processors. Uh, ARM architecture, for example, has a lot of atomics that could be potentially done this way. And going forward, there'll be more of these instructions. Okay, so what did we do in terms of evaluation? Basically, we looked at 10 emerging data-intensive workloads. Uh, I think the workloads are in the next slide. 
Some of them are graph processing, in-memory data analytics, machine learning, and data mining. And we looked at three input sets, small, medium, large, to analyze the impact of data locality. And there's a simulator. And these are the takeaway results. I'm going to give you the takeaways quickly, and then we're going to look at some results uh, in a little bit more detail. Basically, if your input data set is large, you get significant speed up. It's about 47%. It's not 13x again, because you're very limited, but it's not bad. With small input data sets, you still get speed up. Uh, and energy reduction is significant with especially large input data sets. So let's take a look at, uh, these are the workloads. You can read the paper for the workloads. But there are some interesting ones. Uh, if you have large inputs, uh, this is the performance that you would get compared to the baseline, uh, where the instructions are executed in the host only. Uh, if, you, uh, if you ship all of the instructions always to processing in memory, don't make this dynamic decision. It's actually a good decision, maybe. You get significant performance benefit. This is a geometric mean uh, average across all of them. So you get about 50%, no, not 50%, maybe 45% performance benefit. If you're locality aware, you get a little bit more performance benefit because you're a little bit more intelligent in your decision, but not that much more benefit. It's about 47% over here. In some cases, you lose slightly because maybe you made the wrong decision, right? There's a conflict in your table, and you predicted that you should execute in the processor, but you actually execute uh, in memory, should execute in memory. And you see that the uh, normalized amount of off-chip transfer uh, goes down significantly uh, whenever you do uh, you execute the permeable instructions on the memory side or in a locality-aware manner. So the benefits are significant. Now, if you go to small inputs, it's a totally different uh, mm -hmm. graph, as you can see. The same applications, geometric mean. Uh, the baseline is execute the same instructions that uh, with the same applications uh, on the processor side. If you execute the same instructions on the memory side always, you lose performance a lot. Because caching is very effective with small inputs, and you're basically making your caches completely ineffective. You're always communicating with memory in this case. You're communicating with memory because this is at the instruction level, right? Every instruction is basically sending something to memory. If you were actually doing function offloading, this may have a different uh, different view over here, but we're not doing function offloading. Uh, okay, so the performance loss is about 20%. So if you're actually intelligent about it, basically have this predictor that says, oh, if your data is in the cache, don't send stuff to memory, then you basically uh, curb those performance losses. You don't lose performance as much. And this is an outlier. Maybe this should not be a small input set uh, over here, but the caching is not very effective for that over here. Okay. So that's the key point. You, it's, it's important to make the decision dynamically as to what to, uh, whether or not to offload a particular instruction. And at the instruction level, the granularity is very fine. Uh, as a result, you I may mean, actually cause a lot of data movement because you're offloading at the very fine granularity. You keep offloading uh, many, many things to memory. Okay, and clearly, if you're offloading to many things to memory, unnecessarily, you're increasing the amount of off-chip transfer. That's why you're losing performance in these small input sets. Medium inputs are somewhere in between, as expected. The, here, caching is effective on part of the workload. On other part of the workload, caching is not effective, so you have some miss rate that's in the middle. Uh, so if you always offload to memory, uh, actually, it's not bad. It's not a bad choice, as you can see over here. On average, you gain, but you don't gain as much in these workloads. And if you're a little bit more intelligent, if you basically do the decision dynamically, you gain a lot, actually, in, in these workloads, whether you would otherwise don't, not gain much uh, if, you use, if you always execute in the processor or always ex execute in memory. So it's good to be intelligent in your decision making. Of course, as you can see, our decision making is not perfect. Sometimes uh, we do worse than executing always in memory. But on average, uh, the performance improvement is, of this dynamic decision making mechanism is quite good. Of course, there's room for improvement over here. But this is a relatively limited mechanism where the room for improvement is probably not as high as some of the other things that we've discussed. OK, so what about energy consumption? Uh, if you look at energy consumption, this first bar is baseline, CPU only, or host only. The second bar is processing in memory only. Everything is every instruction gets shipped. Every PIM enabled instruction gets shipped to memory. And the last one is the intelligent, locality aware mechanism. So with small input sets, uh, Locality aware buys you a little bit, uh, but doing the wrong thing actually costs you a lot, so you don't want to do the wrong thing. With medium input set, doing the wrong thing still costs you a lot, uh, slightly, uh, but locality aware actually buys you about 10%, I believe 10% energy reduction. 
And if you actually are using large data input sets, that's where you gain a lot. Uh, basically, you, you reduce the energy consumption of a single node by about 25% in this case, which is very significant because it's really the entire energy consumption of the node itself. So this another takeaway over here is processing in memory is better if you have large input data sets and also your ma data is mapped nicely. Right? In this case, we don't have any data mapping problems because we've eliminated that problem. Okay, so let's talk about the advantages. So this is basically one of the simplest approaches to processing in memory. Uh, very interestingly, it, was developed in, until, it wasn't developed until 2013, 14. That's when we started doing the research, actually 13 uh, was when. Uh, but it's always good to think about the minimal approach. Uh, it's low cost, clearly. It's not uh, changing a lot in the system. Uh, there's no change to the programming model, no change to virtual memory. Uh, so that virtual memory problem that we were trying to solve that was very hairy goes away in this case. But of course the benefits also reduce. And uh, it, it has a mechanism to dynamically decide where to execute an instruction. I think that those mechanisms are really important. Uh, the disadvantages are uh, basically it doesn't take full advantage of the pin potential clearly, right? There are a lot of restrictions. Uh, one of the restrictions is the granularity. It's at the instruction granularity. When you go, once, you, once you go into that fine granularity, maybe you're not uh, looking at the full picture of the program, right? You're not offloading a huge function, for example. So what is the best granularity in offloading? That's a good question. And maybe that granularity changes uh, depending on the workload and depending on what you want to do. Uh, also, it doesn't take full advantage of the pin potential because it's restricted to a single block, a uh, single cache block. Uh, so there's granularity as well as uh, the data granularity, right? The data granularity is very fine as well. Uh, yeah. Maybe there are other disadvantages also. Somebody needs to j figure out these instructions, right? That's another potential disadvantage, but I think that's also an opportunity because uh, it's not clear if we have figured out the best instructions and who does that. Uh, analysis is important. So, any questions? Yes, please. What's the reason that you need to uh, use the existing instruction? I don't know. So it's, in a sense, some of them are existing instructions, right? Like if you want to do a PIM add, yeah. you just turn an existing add instruction and mark it as PIM enabled. But some of them are new instructions. So you could use some of the existing instructions, but you need to somehow mark them as PIM enabled, which is really easy, maybe another bit. But some of them, uh, you really want to do, uh, like very, very similar to what we've shown in quantization, for example. Uh, in the existing instructions, maybe you bring data uh, into the ISA, and you can, it's not even considering that something is to be done in main memory. Uh, if you're doing something in main memory, you want to, take advantage of as much as possible of the data that you have over there and operate on it as efficiently as possible. Existing instructions don't consider that right as much. So the instruction set may not have uh, that in mind and they don't actually. So basically we want to get the most value out of the byte that we bring into the logic layer and do the operation very efficiently such that we do minimal communication. Does that make sense? Okay. But that's a good point. I think uh, I mean, what we did not do in this case, actually we did do it. Uh, so uh, whenever we actually added the PIM enabled instruction, uh, the baseline also has that PIM enabled instruction. So the baseline is also efficient from that perspective. <laughs> so we imp improved the baseline a little bit as well. <laughs> because this instruction can be executed either in the processor or main memory. Right? So you have to have computation units that are uh, that are doing the same thing essentially on both sides. But that's a good point, I think. This may be, maybe this is a case for adding Euclidean distance instructions for existing ISAs, right? I haven't thought about it that way. Uh, actually, I have thought about it that way, but <laughs> that's a different direction in a sense. There's a lot of work in that direction also actually. How do you actually uh, design a more flexible ISA uh, uh, such that your instructions are more powerful uh, and, and you get more work done. Like this is toward the, the SIMD instruction direction, right? Any other questions? Is it interesting? <laughs> okay.
Okay. So I think you've seen the simplest approach to PIMP. Maybe you can prove me wrong by finding an even simpler approach. And this is the paper. Uh, okay, as I said, uh, the simplicity, we want to simplify PIM. And this paper actually came about uh, because of the fact that we wanted to simplify PIM. I already talked about this to you. This is where programmer does nothing in this case. And compiler uh, actually figures out what code should be offloaded. Uh, but it's, not, it's changing more in the system in the sense that uh, you need to have uh, a function level, code block level of floating mechanism. So the granularity of this is a little bit higher than the instruction over here. So it's not as simple uh, in that case. Although it's simpler in, simple in the sense that the compiler does a lot over here. Here we didn't talk about the compiler analysis here. Again, these were some workloads that were interesting and uh, somebody, somebody meaning always the first author <laughs> or people who are collaborating together. In this case, it was the first author who did a lot of work to understand the workload and understanding mapping uh, of the instruction to the workload. And he actually put those instructions in the right place in the workload. So this, it was very manual. So it's all, it, you can also, of course, automate this also, right? You can actually uh, have a compiler that generates the instructions based on the uh, source code that you have. But I think here it's important to have programming support a little bit. So if, you don't, uh, if you don't see, for example, that you're doing Euclidean distance computation, at the high level, uh, it's hard, to, hard for a compiler to actually uh, put, put together all of that computation back after, uh, uh, from, from primitive instructions. So if you actually have libraries where uh, you could expose these instructions primitives as primitives to the libraries, and the programmer actually says, OK, I want to do Euclidean distance, for example, or I want to do, I don't know, ha hash table probing. And this could be an instruction in the library, the mapping of uh, the program into instructions becomes a lot simpler. But we didn't tackle that problem, clearly. That's another problem here. OK. Uh, and as I said, this is also another approach that's transparent. Uh, so these pr programmer transparent approaches that are automatic uh, are actually very valuable to develop. And this is another uh, approach that's transparent uh, that offloads these uh, linked data structure traversals to the memory controller. And you could do prefetch mechanisms also. If you're really interested, you can take a look at these other things. We're going to talk about runhead maybe later uh, during the semester. Maybe we can talk about this uh, at that time as well. But I really like this paper uh, because this takes my thesis to the next step, actually. My thesis was actually doing prefetching what's called runahead. Uh, essentially, when, it, when the processor is stalled, you keep executing the program, but you do it as a prefetch thread, if you will, speculatively. And that gets the caches warmed up. So that's good because you tolerate long memory latencies. And we're going to talk about that. But if you actually do it on the memory controller, you expose a lot more potential of this idea. Because while the processor is being stalled, you could actually fetch a lot of things. And when the processor becomes unblocked, you could keep fetching ahead of the processor and feeding the processor with useful data. OK. So uh, data coherence is another hairy issue. Uh, and this paper tackles that data coherence issue. Maybe I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so how do you design a much more efficient cache coherence mechanism that takes into account processing in memory? Maybe you can talk to Minish in the back over here about that. There are more things to do here. I'm going to go into the adoption challenges in a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll take a break. And after that, we'll do that. So basically, we've been talking about uh, data-centric computing architectures. There are a bunch of challenges. And these architectures can be low latency, as we've discussed also. And I'm going to talk about adoption next. Uh, but maybe we should take a break before we do that. How about we take, a, let's say, 13-minute uh, break and be back at 40. And then we'll conclude in the last 20 minutes. Sounds good? OK. <laughs> OK, so we have 20 minutes to finish the processing in memory. Do you think we should do it? I guess so. And then we'll start with emerging technologies next week. That's going to be fun also. OK, so basically, we've covered a lot in processing in memory. We've actually touched upon some of the adoption issues also, uh, especially the minimal processing in memory support is very critical to adoption. As I said, whenever you have a new technology, you can try to do the maximal thing with it. But that maximal thing may not be easy to reach for the masses. Whereas if you do the minimal thing, that will get the masses with a small step toward the right direction. Right? Uh, 
and I think this is really critical for the adoption of new technology because uh, it's really important to get uh, provide ways for people to adopt the technology uh, if you want it to be successful. Of course, you can do nothing and hope that the technology is adopted. That's another possibility, but then the probability of adoption goes down significantly. And usually, uh, in that adoption, software is extremely important. So if you don't really consider the software, especially in a hardware technology, if you don't consider how the software would reach that path and use that hardware technology, then there's a huge problem because in the end, uh, most people are, need to develop software to take advantage of your new technology. And if you don't provide them a path for doing it easily, then you have a big problem. Okay, so basically, we're going to talk about some adoption issues very quickly. I'm not going to give you uh, all solutions, of course. Uh, there are a bunch of barriers to adoption to any technology, and we're going to study it uh, in the specific case of PIM. And usually, as I said, software, uh, what is the functionality that you provide in processing in memory? What are the applications that could benefit? That's why, we're, as I said, we're looking into a lot of workloads, how to automate the workload such that we can figure out how to offload what, uh, so this is the software part. It's very important. It's extremely critical, actually. Of course, this affects the hardware part a little bit also, like what functionality do you need from the PIM, from the workload perspective, affects what you design underneath in the hardware. And it's always good to take bottom-up approach as well as a top-down approach. So, for example, with MBIT, we had the bottom-up approach, right? Okay, this substrate is extremely good with bulk bitwise operations, so how can we take advantage of it at the application level? That's one approach. The other approach is now we have a more general substrate at the uh, memory layer. How can we take advantage of it uh, uh, with different applications? What do different applications need from that memory layer? So it's good to do that bottom up and the top down approach when you're studying the number one over here. And again, with any hardware technology, that's a big question. The second is ease of programming. Again, it's related to software, as you can see. What are the interfaces that you provide? And what is the compiler and hardware support that makes it easy for people to use this technology? And we've seen some examples, right? The transparent offloading and mapping work try to develop a completely transparent approach. Uh, I also alluded to things when you have PIM-enabled instructions, maybe you should have some libraries that can help people. And maybe compilers can use those uh, programs that are programmed using those libraries, right? So those interfaces are actually very important. And there needs to be still a lot of work to be done in this direction as well. That's true for this direction as well. Uh, the third one is system support. Again, this is very related to software, right? Basically, you need to support uh, the, especially the existing models a little bit better. Uh, if you don't support them, then the adoption is by definition is going to be not easy uh, because then you need to ch change the way people think about systems also. So coherence is one example. Virtual memory is another example that we've tackled. We'll talk a little bit more about coherence uh, in a little bit. And, uh, of course, you need to develop the infrastructure, runtime system infrastructure, such that you can decide what to schedule when. You don't want to burden the programmer with this. Uh, and uh, the system is the right place to do it because it's really a dynamic decision. Programmer may not know what's going on uh, in the system, uh, and, but the system knows a lot about what's going on at that point in time. So it needs to do adaptive scheduling, data mapping, and access sharing control. And there's a lot more work to be done in this area also. So far, the applications that I described, for example, the Google workflows paper, we assume that that accelerator is available to the application that's running. But what if you have many different applications running at the same time uh, on a system? How do you actually do the access and sharing control? How do you provide quality of service? How do you do the scheduling? There's a lot uh, of stuff to be done here. And the last one is infrastructure uh, to assess the benefits and feasibility. And this is really important uh, to both develop the mechanisms that are needed over here, and also enable people to maybe evaluate what they uh, design in the end. If they design some piece of software, can they evaluate the benefits of it quickly in some way without having the system implemented yet? And there's a lot of interesting stuff over here. I'm not going to talk about that a lot, but you can see that there's a lot of simulation that goes on. Uh, this, this goes into the simulation lecture that we discussed. Basically, all of this uh, points to the fact that we need to revisit the entire stack, basically. We're thinking about barriers to adoption, and there are barriers to adoption at every level of the stack, potentially. And we need to ensure that those barriers to adoption are solved. And the problem itself that we're discussing is that across the uh, stack problem, as we discussed uh, earlier. So uh, I'm going to go through some of these very quickly. Code mapping, basically which operations should be executed in memory versus in CPU or in GPU. And we've discussed this before. I've said 
compiler approach is one way, but there is many, many potential approaches and how do you do that is still an open problem in general. How should data be mapped to different 3D memory stacks? This is the example that I gave you earlier, right? A, B, C, how do you ensure that uh, you have a good data mapping? Again, if you burden the programmer with it, maybe some programmers will do that, but most of the programmers of the world will basically not do that because they may not even know what's going on here, right, actually. That's, that is true, actually. Most of the programmers in the world don't know. Uh, they, they, they probably think that some magic executes these programs. But <laughs> you know better than that, right? That, that it's not magic underneath. But actually, that is true. I've worked at, at, at many software companies and many programmers have no idea what's going on underneath, except for those that need to tune their program. And then they become familiar, or they're already familiar because they're in that job to begin with. And they're the ones who can tune, but that's a very small fraction in general. Okay, so I've already talked about some of these works. You can take a look at that. Let me talk about coherence a little bit, uh, because it's actually interesting and hairy also. And if you're really interested, you should talk to Minesh, because I want to finish this lecture. Basically, uh, these are some workloads, some graph processing and in-memory database workloads, hybrid transactional and analytical processing workloads. Again, Amirali figured out these workloads and figured out which portions should be offloaded to memory. And then he offloaded them to memory, and then he looked at the effect of different coherence mechanisms. So this is, uh, the baseline is uh, uh, CPU only, and uh, the next three bars over here, this is geometric mean across all workloads, next three bars show that you have fine grain coherence, basically every cache line needs to have, go through coherence checks, permission checks. This is coarse grain coherence, basically you flush the caches, uh, uh, whenever you need to operate on a par portion of the program in main memory. And this is non-cacheable. Basically, you don't use the CPU cache in this case. Whenever you're operating, for the regions that you're operating on memory, you don't use the CPU caches at all. These things are marked non-cacheable. So these are three approaches to coherence traditionally done. Uh, as you can see, if you do fine-grain coherence, you get a little bit of benefit, but not a lot. Ideal PIM is basically there's no coherence overhead. So in these workloads, with this offloading, you get 50% performance benefit if there's no coherence overhead that you need to uh, pay, which is not bad actually, 50% is actually a pretty good number uh, for these traditional workloads with function offloading. Uh, you could do better, you could always say, oh, maybe you could do better function offloading, but that, uh, now you need to have a better programmer. Uh, okay, so clearly none of these coherence mechanisms is good. Actually, if, if you do coarse grain coherence, you lose performance. If you do non-cacheable, you lose performance. And there are a lot of backup slides that you can take a look at why you lose performance, because if you use non-cacheable, basically CPU is not taking advantage of uh, the caches anymore. And some part of the program is touching caches uh, when you're executing on the CPU. And when you're executing on memory, maybe it's okay, it's not touching caches, it doesn't have the coherence overhead, but th these caches are important. So there's a mechanism called lazy PIM, uh, which actually gets a good chunk of the performance benefits. And the idea is it's a mostly transactional execution. Basically on the PIM side, when you're uh, touching memory, you assume that CPU is not going to touch memory but you record which addresses you're actually touching, and CPU also records which addresses it's touching, and at the end of the uh, PIM execution, you check whether you overlap with the CPU using signatures and using comparisons, and bloom filters are used for those comparisons in this case. And if you have overlap with the CPU, meaning that CPU has written to a location that you actually read, or both of you have written to locations that are the same, then you actually say, okay, PIM execution read, did the wrong thing. It's conflicted with the CPU and you roll back PIM execution to the beginning uh, of the PIM kernel. That's the idea. So this is very similar to transactional memory principles, except in this case only uh, the PIM rolls back, which is interesting. But yeah, that's the idea. And you can read the paper for more detail or talk to Minesh in the back, right? Okay. Okay, so, but this is still a problem. Uh, th there's inefficiency in this mechanism also. There's overhead uh, in the bloom filters, for example. How do you actually make this more efficient is important. And this is the paper. Okay, I already talked about how to support virtual memory. This is an open problem still, especially with large memory systems. Or how do you rethink virtual memory in the presence of processing in memory? This is going to be also interesting when we talk about uh, emerging memory technologies, which hopefully provide a large amount of address space. And also, how do you think, rethink the data structures? I think it's also an interesting paper because uh, if you actually have uh, concurrent data structures in the CPU, you have a lot of parallelization in the CPU. And if you offload something to PIM, and if you don't have concurrency over there, then you actually lose performance compared to uh, the parallelism that you get uh, in, the, uh, in the cores. 
So you need to design concurrent data structures for near memory computation as well, and this paper tackles that problem. But there's a lot more work to be done in this area as well. So simulation infrastructures, I'm not going to talk about this more. There are a bunch of simulation infrastructures that I mentioned, but Remulator is an example to be developed. You can talk to Geraldo about this uh, more if you're interested actually in these infrastructures. Geraldo is doing a lot of work in simulation uh, on Remulator, but other students also. Uh, okay, and maybe SoftMC can be used for uh, PIM emulation as well. So there's some other work processing in memory, some applica new application and use case. I'm not going to go over this. Uh, actually, I think um, Mohammed talked about this, right? Do you remember in bioinformatics acceleration? Basically, he talked about a bunch of approaches. Maybe he didn't talk. I think I think he did talk about Grim filter a little bit, but. You can take uh, what Mohammed talked about, basically this is accelerating the uh, DNA uh, read mapping using processing in memory. And again, I'm not going to go through this, but the applications are important. But you can look at the slides over here. This is basically, you need to lay out your genome, uh, you need to represent your genome in a way that is nice to process inside your memory. And this paper basically shows that you could actually process a good chunk of your genome in parallel by chunking it into different bins and representing the existence of uh, these different, um, what did we call them? Uh, it's missing me, tokens, yes. These different tokens in their reference genome. Basically, you, you, you chop your reference genome into bins and you basically represent the existence of these tokens in these different bins. And whenever you're searching uh, when, uh, for a read in the reference genome, you're basically looking at whether this token exists. And if this token exists, then you get a one in the comparison over here, otherwise you get a zero in the comparison. And then if you accumulate those ones and zeros, you can build the confidence as to whether your read exists in a particular bin or not. That's the key idea over here. And this map nicely, of course, now we've redefined how we represented the reference genome. And this maps nicely to a memory bank, and you can do a lot of these computations in parallel uh, in the logic layer, as you can see over here. And the uh, comparison operations are very, very simple. So I've given you a very, very high level, very, very quick summary of uh, how you do the filtering inside the memory. And the benefits are significant. You basically get significant performance benefits. It's about 2 to uh, 3.7x. I believe there is more benefit possible. Again, if you're really interested in this, Jeremy uh, is the right person to talk with. OK, I'm going to skip this one. OK, so if you're interested in other adoption issues, we've actually recently written this paper. Uh, it's, a book, it's a long book chapter that talks about uh, adoption issues and processing in memory. And I'd recommend that you take a look at that. Uh, so basically, this is really a paradigm shift that is trying to uh, happen. And uh, I've already said the paradigm shift to you. So I'm not going to talk about this also. Do you remember the Thomas Kuhn book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? How many of you have read it by now? No one, okay. <laughs> Maybe I should give the book to the top student in the exams. <laughs> okay, I'll think about that. <laughs> so this is something that's really good to read, I think. Uh, but I cannot require it. It's, not, it's nothing about computer architecture, really. <laughs> Although I could technically require it, but maybe you won't learn a lot about computer architecture. <laughs> you will learn a lot about philosophy of science. It could be very useful, though. Okay. OK, anyway, uh, so let me conclude. I think I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, to basically uh, uh, wrap up processing in memory. So essentially, we've covered a lot of directions so far, uh, and some of the motivated processing in memory. Actually, how to improve security, reliability, and safety with processing in memory is also interesting, which we really didn't touch upon. Maybe you can design a more secure system if you have processing in memory in place. That's good to think about. Certainly processing in memory enables more energy efficient and low latency architectures, and it enables these different things more efficiently, potentially. So basically, processing in memory enables a lot of speed. <laughs> and maybe you don't really care about anything else but just speed, right? This is the fun part of it. OK, so let me do some concluding remarks. Uh, you remember this, right? I said this earlier. This was a quote from a famous architect. That's Frank Lloyd Wright. He said, architecture should be based upon principle and not upon precedent. And this person uh, actually uh, designed a lot of architectures based upon principle, not upon precedent. If we were designing something based upon precedent, which means what came before, he would have designed something like this, perhaps, which is not bad. Actually, I, I don't mind having this. It's peaceful, probably. But it's really not something out of the ordinary, basically. This may do the job, but maybe not as excitingly and efficiently as this one. <laughs> 
This is falling water. How many of you have been there? Nobody in the back? Well, oh, Minesh hasn't been there? Okay. <laughs> well, we need to do a field trip to falling water. <laughs> this is close to Pittsburgh, basically. Uh, and it's, it's basically the masterpiece of this architect. Uh, and there's a principle behind this, and it's actually beautiful. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, it's, it's more beautiful than this picture shows, I think. Although this picture is not terrible. Um, basically, it's on a waterfall, and the waterfall, uh, the building imitates how the waterfall actually falls. Like these cantilevers are actually supposed to imitate this waterfall, and it's very beautiful. It's organic architecture. It's supposed to be, uh, 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 essentially, it's supposed to uh, promote architecture that's integrated with uh, the surroundings and the natural world. I showed you this before. This is the train station. It's not bad, right? It's a precedent-based design. And I think a lot of the train stations look similar in Switzerland or in many places, actually, they look similar. Uh, but there are some train stations that are different that look like this. So this is a more principled design. Actually, this is a principled design also, but the principle is some different principle uh, that has been the dominant principle, dominant paradigm, if you will. Uh, this is another paradigm that's different. Uh, it's, it has a different principle. And this is another principle design. Uh, this is in, you know this place, right? Lisbon. Lisbon, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, this was the first place I visited when I first went to Lisbon, actually. After the airport, there's a train from here to the Gar in Lisbon. And you can go there. It's beautiful. Uh, and yeah, that's the principle. This is another principle. This is in Sevilla. What does it look like to you? Anybody? Imagination? Nobody's from Spain here? What about this thing over here? It looks like a head and an eye. It's a pigeon. <laughs> According to the architect, it's supposed to be a pigeon. <laughs> and the architect is the same as the architect of this thing and this thing, Stahlhofen, and this thing, Oculus. And Santiago Calatrava, uh, who's an ETH alumnus. And these architects actually tend to be pretty expensive. This is $4 billion, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and actually, that, uh, the falling water is, was actually extremely expensive also. So they eventually said, OK, you cannot do these things. So that's actually not uh, the full design that Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to do. And this is also true for this thing, as I mentioned when we first started, right? This thing was supposed to uh, do a lot more than what it looks like right now. And, but there's a principle over here, which is zoomorphic architecture. Uh, and we've talked about this earlier. Basically, you have uh, the using animal, you use animal forms as an inspirational basis or a blueprint for architectural design. So now this brings us back to architecture. Do we have the overarching principles for computing? Uh, it's not clear if this is true. Uh, but the current principle, current dominant principle, is really processor-centric design principle. Maybe there are accelerators in between, and there are a bunch of execution paradigms that we really covered in digital circuits, certainly. So there are a bunch of stuff, but all of, the, all of those are uh, uh, from the higher level principle that we have, we have this processor centricity, if you will. Is that the right principle for computing? Or is that, should that be the only principle? That's not clear. I don't believe so. I think we should really be discovering new principles and I think in-memory computation is more similar to what nature may look like, nature may behave, because it's not clear if there's a huge dichotomy between computation and processing in what we do in the nature, uh, in the brain, for example. I'm not saying brain is the right thing to imitate necessarily, but clearly it's one of those low-power devices that are around uh, today. Uh, and maybe we should be thinking about principles uh, of computing uh, in a different way than we've been used to so far. So basically, I think it's time to design principal system architectures to solve the memory problem. Uh, we're not at the end of the memory lectures, but we're getting close to the end. Uh, but processing in memory is a very good example uh, of a principal system architecture, I think. Uh, we want to design complete systems to be balanced, high performance, and energy efficient, which means that they have to be data centric. You cannot ignore the data. You cannot be processor centric. You have to be memory centric somehow, which means that we need to enable computation capability inside or close to memory. Uh, and this can actually lead to orders of magnitude improvements. I've given you a bunch of examples, right, that gave us orders of magnitude improvements, either at the application level or at the operation level. Uh, and uh, this could enable new applications as well as computing platforms that we may not imagine today, right? 
if you actually have this processing in memory system, maybe someone will come up with a very different uh, way of dealing with applications and enable a better understanding of nature. I actually strongly believe that uh, there is more to be done in this area. And who knows what else, right? If you actually enable this, there could be something else that can come up. Of course, it's not easy. Uh, I believe there are a lot of challenges in underlying technology and overlying problems. These adoption challenges that I listed are very interesting challenges, but the benefits could be very high. Of course, we need to solve the, to, to solve the challenges and to enable the technology, you need to think it across the stack and design enabling systems, which means that you need to solve all of those adoption challenges somehow, and also come up with ways of uh, getting these systems, even though it may not be generally adopted uh, initially, getting these systems into place. Right? But I think people have done it before, uh, so it's not like we haven't done things like this before. If I have to name a single technology, electronic technology, uh, memory technology, let's say, that has been extremely successful and that has really revolutionized our lives in the last 30 years, what would it be, you think? It's not DRAM. DRAM is much older than 30 years. Any, any guesses? Yes? Flash memory. Absolutely. Yeah, flash memory. Right. Flash memory is everywhere right now and it's, it's really an enabler for these devices, right? I cannot imagine carrying a, a hard disk right now on that thing and I, I definitely cannot imagine carrying a mag magnetic disk over here, right? That has really enabled pretty much all of the mobile devices that we have. And it's, it's going strong. But it has not been always the case, right? This thing actually, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into uh, enabling flash memory. Initially, it was a very doubtful emerging technology in the 1980s. Actually, Toshiba didn't recognize the benefit of it. The inventor of the flash memory didn't actually get a lot of promotion in Toshiba to begin with. Uh, but also, uh, Academics didn't get recognized for it. For example, I have a lot of friends who had worked on this memory in the 1980s, 19, early 1990s, and they were writing proposals to the National Science Foundation in the United States. And people were saying, who cares about this technology? Right. And they were writing proposals on garbage collection, for example, garbage collection for flash memories. And usually you have these naysayers that don't understand the technology. As a result, they say, OK, this is useless. But we know by now that that's not the right approach to a new technology. Uh, this mindset is really important. But this thing got enabled, and it got enabled, and now it's very sophisticated, right? People actually built systems to make sure that this memory works. And once you do that, you revolutionize the world. But it's not easy, uh, and flash memory is actually the easier part compared to processing in memory, I think, because it's a system by itself. You can actually isolate it from the other parts as much and improve it as much as possible, whereas processing in memory changes a lot in the uh, existing system. But th there's a lot of work that went into flash memory as we discussed. Uh, well, I didn't discuss that in detail yet, but uh, this paper I mentioned earlier also. So if you're really interested in just one aspect of flash memory, which is really how to ensure you actually uh, make it, uh, you actually operate it reliably, you can take a look at this paper. And this covers all of the state of the art techniques uh, that we know of uh, today. Well today meaning September 2017, but there is an updated book chapter uh, that, uh, that has 2018 in it. Okay, so basically uh, we need to enable processing in memory also. It won't be easy, but it can provide a lot of benefits, like revolutionize our world just like flash memory did. And I think it will be even more than flash memory uh, if, we, if we do it. I think that brings me to the end. Looks like we're over. Any questions? Burning questions? Okay. Otherwise, we can part. Have a good weekend. I'll see you next week. <laughs>